Welcome to Delta Green, Impossible Landscapes, brought to you by Black Project Gaming. Get read in at blackprojectgaming.com. I'm Vince, your host and handler for this campaign. Joining me are Brett, as FBI hostage rescue team operator Ira Brewer, also known as Agent Morgan. Cammy as Dr. Jenny Archer, anthropologist and Delta Green friendly. Doug as FBI Special Agent Mark Hansom, also known as Agent Meshock. And Jack as FBI Special Agent Cassandra Reese, also known as Agent Madison. Impossible Landscapes is a campaign of wonder, horror, and conspiracy, written by Dennis Dentwiller for Delta Green, the role-playing game. For more information on Delta Green, please visit delta-green.com. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. With our last session, a lot happened. Um, you all found out, discovered a lot, a lot went down. It was pretty crazy. So we picked up the last uh, session with you all having left the McAllister building and kind of planning your way ahead. Cassie, you caught Ira going back to Manuel's apartment and locking the door with Manuel's keys, which was your first indicator that maybe something was wrong. Uh, and at that point, you all kind of decided, hey, let's, you know, we're all going to reconvene at the Best Western in Hell's Kitchen, discuss our way ahead for the next day and go from there. Uh, you all eventually did reconvene after Cassie, you tried to call your boyfriend. Um, Jenny, you were able to get a hold of Luke and you all spoke, discussed what you were going to do the next day and then kind of went your separate ways. Uh, Jenny, however, returned to the McAllister building in true this group fashion um, and uh, went up to the uh, the fourth floor uh, to the smoking lounge and began to explore uh, the hallways beyond. It was at that point that she uh, had a couple of encounters. There was the uh, the specter of the the hung man, the hanged man who floated past her, uh, said something about a ballroom. There was David Langford who seemed to be trapped in the night floors and couldn't get out. Uh, but he was scared off by this manifestation of this strange clockwork child uh, that bore an invitation with the name of Ian F. to Craig, uh, a name that had come up before, uh, both, I believe, on the box that was left in the hallway as well as in one of the portraits. Also saw a familiar figure uh, that was pointing the way for her. She followed and saw another manifestation of two people being pursued by three men in strange gas masks with shotguns. And when she rounded the corner, they were uh, just collapsed clockwork marionettes with red tissue paper coming out of them in an approximation of blood. Freaking the hell out, understandably, Jenny decided to try to leave finally and was able to actually make her way back to the smoking lounge and out of the building. Uh, later that night, Ira and Cassie, uh, Ira went to Cassie and requested her help in cleaning up whatever mess he had left back at the McAllister building, uh, which ended up being, well, it should have been Thomas Manuel's body. Uh, but when you all got there, you discovered that there was no body. It was gone. And Cassie took the opportunity to search the apartment again and found some cassette tapes that were unlabeled, a uh, bronze medallion uh, locket, and a play that seemed to foretell the arrival of you all to the McAllister building. Cassie did take a carton of milk out of the refrigerator and bring it with her. And as soon as it left the building, it essentially rotted on the spot, took some sand loss from that. Uh, but you all went back to your hotel room, reconvened the next day. Cassie and Ira went to begin their search of Abigail Wright's apartment, or really Cassie went to search, Ira provided security. Jenny and Mark went and did their started some research into the into the background of the McAllister building. Uh, Mark found out that the architect was one Asa Darabandi, who was a serial killer accused of killing at least five children in the late 1940s, early 1950s, but could have killed as many as 20 uh, beginning in the 1920s. Tried to look up some additional information on some of the names that were found on the portraits with the bottles, but wasn't able to find much. But you were able to uh, find out more about Henry Lundeen, who had commissioned the construction of the, the McAllister building, and Gary Topchick, who was a director who was accused of drowning children in New York and had been incarcerated in uh, Bellevue Hospital, uh, a psychiatric institution. Jenny also did some research, found out some information on the Castain family in the 1400s in France, on... Ian DeCraig himself, who was a prisoner in Juliet and who mysteriously vanished uh, while incarcerated. 
and then also was able to find a copy of Asa Darabandi's personal journal, which outlined his descent into um, insanity, these calls from this person he called Bale, who was instructing him to kill children, and how he came into possession of a copy of a play known as The King in Yellow, uh, but had at previous times been identified as Loa in June and the Libro Secretorum Manifesto, I believe. And with that, that essentially took up your entire day of research and you all reconvened back at the McAllister building. Cassie had actually found some stationery uh, from a place called the Hotel Broadlebin with a map and uh, labeled J.L. Bottle, uh, who Mark actually put two and two together and figured out it may have been referring to J. Lynn's, which is one of the portraits you found in the hallway on the night floors. Cassie, though, couldn't shake this feeling that she was being watched definitely reeling from her discoveries and the fact that when she went up and out of the roof, uh, it it was just a roof. There was no smoking lounge. There was no fourth floor. Uh, But when we last left you all, Cassie was up there on the roof with Ira, beginning to make her way back down while Jenny and Mark were going to get some food. And I believe right at that point, Mark had actually called to see if he could find a hotel brought in, but there was no such hotel by that name. So I think that's it, uh, unless anybody had any questions. No, I think that's it. Awesome. So, yeah, uh, let's kick this thing off. Cassie and Ira, what are you two doing? Uh, I think Ira is waiting kind of quietly by the door, holding the door open for Cassie. Uh, She just had that moment where it kind of looked like she was going to jump off the roof. Uh, And I think he'd said, you good, from the doorway. And that was kind of where it was was ended. I wasn't going to jump. You saw what was here last night. I did. Why is it not here anymore? He kind of, he gives her like a really tired, like, shrug. This stuff is not explainable. Trying to explain it is going to drive you insane. Back at the lounge, did, did anything jump out at you? Any, did you recognize anything like personal? No. I don't believe that. So I want to human him. <laughs> Go for it. Go ahead and roll. God damn it. Uh, 82. 82 out of 66. No, just that same kind of flat affect. Just so difficult to read. Then why do you think I... Why do you think it's speaking to me? What do you mean speaking to you? Uh, not, not in a literal sense, but... I, I, there was a mural... That, that was being painted by these strange people in these sil- cheap silver robes and these like strange paper mache masks in, in this place. I've seen those masks on these people, on the people that were in that book. And I, 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 you saw them too when I showed them. There is a silver robe in that box that the, the, the man with the arms, the, the burns on his arms. It was in that. Cassandra, trying to figure this out is going to kill you. Stop. I just want to know why me. And if it's just me. Ira kind of shrugs. Better to, yet to ask the others. Fine. Let's, let's, get back, let's get back to the stairs. He nods and kind of steps aside to allow her to walk past him down the stairs. Yeah, she'll... Uh very quietly, uh, almost somber in a way, head back towards uh, Abigail's room and wait for the others. All right. Jenny and Mark, what's your plan? Um, I think we're just going down the street to grab a couple sandwiches, so not too far. I think Benny, Benny, <laughs> Jenny <laughs> is uh, still pretty quiet. Not super talkative. Yeah, I, I think... I mean, Mark would ask Jenny to compare notes about what they, uh, what they read about and learned uh, in their research. He's really excited to uh, get to the bottom of this, so probably they'll they'll exchange notes. Yeah, actually, she will ask if the name, did the name David Langford, come up at all? David, uh, no, no, I don't think it did. Hmm. Is that? Is that somebody else? Um, and where, where do you hear that name? 
Oh, um, it's, I'm not sure if it's anything, but it's a missing person that I was just wondering if could have been potentially related. Well, I I checked on any police reports involving this building and crimes all the way back to like the 1920s. I didn't see a line for it on there. Okay. Probably nothing then. It was just a potential hunch, but... All right. So are we going to Subway's or... <laughs> I would assume there's like some kind of little bodega or deli or something on some oh, corner. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's New York, right? <laughs> yeah, of course there is. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you all are able to easily uh, find a little uh, a little shop that sells sandwiches. You pick up some food. And uh, you know, we'll say you make your way back to the McAllister building and reconvene with Cassie and Ira in Abigail's apartment. Yeah, I'll set out the food and probably grab some more coffee just in case. Just set that out on the table. Yeah. Uh, Cassandra's pretty quiet when you get in. It uh, looks like she's just, because uh, it's towards the end of the uh, so-called day, right? It's like the end of our, not allowable time, but like uh, it, it's getting close to dark. Right. I would say probably um, push in sometime between five and six at this point and sunset uh, in the summer is probably around eight o'clock thereabouts. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then she'll be, she'll just kind of start tidying up and getting her kit together, knowing that she'll have to come back tomorrow. So Cassandra, what, what's this, uh, this receipt you say you found? Receipt? Um, For another apartment? Cassandra will, will go through her things, the things that she's collected over the day and present the receipt to everybody. So, it says here this is for apartment 10B. Yeah. Um, I don't remember seeing a 10B down on the on the uh, mailboxes downstairs. Was there? Uh, quick question. Are we in... Abigail's apartment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was uh, standing out in the hallway eating a sandwich. All right. I'll go ahead and go down and check the mailboxes. Actually, let me just see. Yeah. So 1A was occupied by Abigail Wright. 2B was occupied by Manuel. Mm -hmm. 3A is occupied by Karun. 4A, Post. 5A, Empty. 6B, Van Fitz. 7B, Empty. 8A, Empty. 9A, Empty. 10B, Empty. 11B, Empty. Oh, so 10B. 10B is potential. I mean, heck. We should check out apartment 10B. Uh, I agree. Um, it, what's concerning, though, is the date. Uh, yeah, that's after she disappeared. Well, um, if anyone would like to join me, Mark, I assume you would uh, care. Yeah, let's check this place out, man. I mean, okay. all this stuff is so weird. I just want to I just want to get to the bottom of this. Yeah, uh, same. Uh, Jenny, uh, and you see when she says your name, she just looks at you and kind of opens her hands a bit in this sort of uh, kind of like surrender or surrendering motion, just like knowing that you're just going to come along anyway. <laughs> yeah, she smiles a little bit and nods. Yeah, I'm coming. Yeah, I guess we'll walk to uh, 10B. Yeah, the door opens, uh, Ira and the three of them kind of come marching out clearly with some kind of purpose and some kind of destination in mind. Yeah. He uh, like packs in the last bit of his sub sandwich, swallows it very quickly. Looks like he's going to say something to you guys and then just kind of shakes his head. And when you walk in whichever direction, he'll follow him behind you. So you get up to apartment 10 B, which is on the third floor. And what do you do? Well, you said the door is open, right? Like it's not no. locked. Oh no, it's locked. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Cassandra will motion over to Ira. Do you happen to have any skills? Uh, and she tilts her head down towards the, the knob. Ira will motion with his head for her to stand to the side. And as soon as she moves, he's going to kick the door in. I was thinking something maybe, maybe a bit more quiet. <laughs> it's, it's, it's already happened. 
<laughs> okay. Roll uh just roll strength roll. Oh no. Yeah. Fifty seven out of seventy. Nice. Yeah, you, you plant your foot right next to the uh to the deadbolt to the knob and boom, the in, the entire door frame just flies off as the door j- is just kicked in. He still has that like dead expression on his face, but somehow you get the idea that he's feeling pretty smug about himself <laughs> and that. Uh, and then he steps back and motions you to go inside. Yeah, she'll step in first, but she'll cast a lingering side eye towards him as she gets in there. And yeah, with gloves back on, uh, she's going to feel around first for a light to see if it works, see if the electricity is on. It does. And there's still sunlight streaming in through the blind covered window. So there is some ambient light, but you find the light switch, you flick it, the lights turn on, and it is immediately clear that this apartment has not been occupied in some time. There's a thin layer of dust coating every conceivable surface. No furniture, nothing in the refrigerator. It is bare. Can I, because I'm sure it is just bare, but the way things have been shaping up, can I look around, can I focus a little bit and look around to see if I see anything out of the ordinary or anything that, you know, springs to mind? Absolutely. Yeah, I'd say just with your base search score, taking your time, kind of going through the apartment very methodically. You look for any signs that anybody has lived here within the past, even a week, you know, just the uh, on the off chance that somebody has been up here to disturb this dust and uh, a squatter, another resident, somebody, but there is nothing. And the only tracks in the dust are your own footsteps. Can I look for any kind of, you know, secret compartments uh, doors, loose floorboards, that sort of thing. Absolutely, yeah. If you want to, yeah. If you want to roll a search for that, go for it. Search. Seventy-one out of seventy-two. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow, <laughs> that was cutting it close. Cutting it close. Just made it. Uh, there's nothing. You are. You have this conviction that there has to be something here, and there usually is in your line of work. There's always something to be found somewhere. Uh, but unfortunately, you look and you look, and eventually that conviction begins to subside into doubt. And soon, you've covered every surface of that apartment with Cassie. And there's no chance that the two of you could have missed something working together. And you kind of resigned yourself to the fact that there is, oddly, nothing here. Hmm. Huh. Okay. Um. I mean, this is a little crazy, but so is everything else that we've dealt with so far. But if when we went up to the roof today, it was the roof. It wasn't the other night. What if there's something in here that operates in a similar way? It's just not available now or something that we can perceive now, but at another time, maybe it will be. You mean this could be maybe like another smoking room i mean it's not the craziest thing based on everything else it's a little crazy but not the craziest the problem is figuring out when that happens so i've been up to the roof twice and it's a roof it's not there's no lounge there's nothing except the open air you know i'm just going on a hunch here but why don't we try uh, going up to the smoking lounge uh round after dark cassandra shoots him a bit of a a look like uh it's kind of incredulous like are you kidding this is you know like it's going to play by these kind of rules and uh it, what makes you think after dark just because it's a trope well it's first of all that's like the spookiest thing well not the spookiest but it's it's a little spooky right but but mostly i mean that's when we went there, right? And it was after dark. Worth a shot. Sundown isn't in for another f- couple of hours. So, do we? Do you feel like waiting here, or if, are you planning on returning here? Well, we just had dinner. I mean, look, I can, I can take a look at some of this artwork, see if I can find another receipt or something. Fair. Okay. Ira, 
Yeah, is Iris set up outside the door again? Oh yeah, he's standing outside. He's doing his same thing where he's like in the hallway just outside the door with the door open so he can hear if something goes on, but he's got his arms crossed in the hallway. Um, so if Cassandra says it loud enough for him to hear, he'll poke his head into the door and go, yeah. We're staying until dark. All right. If that's the case, what do you think happens if you're on the roof now and you stay on the roof until it gets dark? How would that work? I mean, if these are the rules, do you like get sucked in or did you find the loophole? You know, <laughs> she, like, <laughs> she like looks around at the others kind of like just trying to make conversation. <laughs> Why would you ever want to know that? I don't know. It's a question. Ira sticks his head back out the door and stands back out in the hallway. One thing at a time, Jenny. Okay, we need. We don't even know these rules. If there are rules. Yeah, I mean, we have two hours to kill. So I thought I'd just pose a hypothetical. But... Well, now that you mention it, I'm thinking about it too. See? Okay, would yeah. you rather? Would you rather get stuck on a roof with no way down because the smoking room is blocking it? and you may never get back down, or would you rather you're on the roof and then you get sucked into some weird black hole anomaly because you found the loophole and it doesn't like that you found it? I would think that would be the worst now that I'm saying it out loud. Well, I ain't gonna do it first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, just Sandra imagine just, all the looks. <laughs> yeah, Sandra's just taken aback, shaking her head a bit. Okay, so I'm guessing the group so who, who's going where? Is Are we going to divide and conquer? Some go to the roof to wait. Some go down to search. Mark does not want to go on the roof. <laughs> yeah, and neither does Cassandra. Jenny I definitely <laughs> tells me how to go on the it's roof. It's just a hypothetical question. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think if anybody tried to actually get onto the roof to wait, that's the only time Ira would intervene. <laughs> <laughs> the X-Files are out now, right? She's a big X-Files fan. Oh, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So, yeah, I think Mark's going to stay here and search the room. And while he does talk to the others about what they found today, I'll just pass the, that information on to everybody else. It's just about the killers and... Yeah, especially the Darabondi family and Ian Frederick de Craig, Charles Lundin, Henry Lundin. Just because I don't remember the... Um... Did Cassandra tell uh, Jenny and Mark about the map? Yes. Yeah, because Mark was the one who picked up on JL being potentially got it. Jenkins. Okay. Yeah, got it. Got it. And I will say, Je Jenny, when you hear Mark talk about Charles Lundeen and how he hung himself in, a, in the second floor ballroom, that jogs your memory. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jenny's just quiet. Well that's being discussed uh, with my human of 66 would i pick up on anything <laughs> <laughs> and i don't want to say anything but yeah go ahead and roll oh shit <laughs> no i will always make just to keep things a little interesting when it comes to you all together when you're doing the human and persuade against each other i'll always make you roll just keep things interesting yeah so yeah, Jack, with that 99 out of 66, who boy, you're still reeling from pretty much everything you, yeah. you dealt with today. Uh, Mark, did you want to roll as well? Yeah, I will. Because I mean, I think that's the sort of thing that, you know, Mark's good at. So he would, Absolutely. He would pay attention to that. Well, are you searching at this point? Because you you all are back in Abigail's apartment, right? Yes, uh, yeah, I would say so, yeah. Yeah, okay. so I might not necessarily be looking at her. Got it. Yeah. So yeah. roll your search. I'll give you one search roll since this is going to take a couple hours. Okay. For you to find something. We'll go with, so yeah, so you'll do your search roll instead of the human roll. All right. That's Ooh, a 59 yeah. out of 72. I got something for you, Mark. Hey. Nice. Hold, yeah. hold on. I, what the heck? Oh, you're going to like this. There you go. All right, then. You find meticulous plans for odd mechanical machines drawn in ballpoint pen on what looks like unfolded thick paper napkins with gold initials in the corner. GBR. 
One diagram is labeled the lion in Portuguese. The other is labeled the scribe in Portuguese. Ah, Leo. Oh, that's cool. GBR. Does that, does that ring any bells to anybody? Looking at the list now. I mean, the whole little like machinery and like it kind of feels like the, you know, the clockwork creations and that guy who was super talented. Uh, but those aren't his initials. But what's his name? Yeah, Castain. Uh, Castain. Yeah, Gabriel yeah. Castain. Castain. Yeah. Right. That definitely looks like that. And remember, I mean, we saw that uh, girl in the ballroom, right? She turned into a bunch of gears. Yeah. But there was her name on there, too. Um, and does the name line up with anything that I'm seeing on these napkins? So not on the napkins, um, but let me find the the name G. Castain was on the gears. clockwork gears. Yep. Yeah. That uh, that name Chastain was on the gears. Right, right. But GBR. And that diagram, Mark, especially the one for the lion, that one looks familiar. Older, maybe. Much more primitive. Not nearly as refined. But there was a fraternity house where you remember seeing something broken down. Ah, yeah. This, I mean, you were asking earlier, Cassandra, if uh, if any of this stuff looks familiar. Yes. This thing looks, well, it's not exactly the same, but uh, I've seen something like this before. What? Where? Holy cow. This is something like this killed a bunch of people. Wait, wait, what? Yeah, bunch of bunch of engineering students. Uh, what do you mean it killed people? Did, you, did you... I don't. You know, we showed up after it was all over, and it, we just saw the carnage. We? Yeah. Well. Me and um, some other, some other people from, you know, the agency, the group. When was this? It wasn't but a year, a year and a half, half ago. Yeah, uh, it was a bunch of, bunch of engineering students at a university, and they was. They seemed like they was obsessed with building this thing, and and then everything just spun out of control. Do you know what it does? What its purpose is? Did you all activate it at all? Uh, no, no, we. Well, we we covered everything up, made it look like it was a gas leak, carbon dioxide. How did it kill them? I mean, like slicing and dicing and it wasn't pretty i mean it fits the pattern that we have so far right with people building or creating things to a point of obsession i mean we have the clock thing we had the guy who painted we have abigail potentially with her hoarding art situation and then we had uh an architectural oddity with secret doors and what crazy things like that. I mean, it, it fits. Manuel with the tapes. I will say you wouldn't have been able to see this cause he is standing out in the hallway. But as soon as you guys started talking about that, like compulsive building of things and how that's kind of like a common theme, Ira sort of like almost inadvertently leans towards the opening of the door, like where he's left it open and starts listening very intently to the conversation. And I will say, Mark, now that you're kind of talking about it and you're thinking back to what you saw at that scene, you recall that some were indeed impaled and cut up, but others were crushed. Uh, almost the only time you had ever seen anything even remotely like that was when you were in your FBI training and they showed 
various scenes of various injuries as part of your forensics familiarization, especially with people crushed by cars that they were working on, where they collapse onto their chests, onto their heads. You, those are some of the injuries you saw inside that house, impalement and being crushed by a considerable weight. Now, was the machine in that case large enough to be like a car crushing somebody? Perhaps if given enough momentum and enough speed, but okay. when you were there, it was already completely falling apart. It, it, to the best of your recollection and to the way the team that you were with made it sound, this thing essentially fell apart as it went on its rampage. It was not right, right. well, it was not well built. Yeah. It tore itself apart. Right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, all thinking about it, I say, yeah, I don't know. I mean, somehow this, well, it did a lot of, it was, God, it was awful. Um, but it, it crushed people as, as well as, you know, stick them and all that. And roll sand for me, Mark, by the way. Oop, okay. Just as these, mem these memories are coming back unbidden and, oh, easy. Eight. Eight out of 70, you lose nothing. All right. Calm, cool, and collected, Mark Hansen. That's right. He's just kind of thinking about it. Man, if somebody's, I wouldn't want to see what happens if somebody made one of these. Do those words together, or just based on the other research we've done, have any significance or in an anthropological sense being together? They do not. Yeah, they don't. They don't ring any bells for you specifically. I mean, in in your experience, you've seen all sorts of construction and all sorts of uh, projects that folks are working on, but nothing like nothing like this. Yeah, I was wondering if like the lion and the scribe might be something kind of like tarot, where it's just like some kind of spiritual or cultural significance. But okay, no, it's nothing that there are definitely applications and various communities and some uh, occult followings, but nothing that stands out to your mind immediately as being particularly relevant. At least not when connected to, well, yeah, not when connected to like uh, like engineering and, and machinery. Right. Yeah. Okay. But I will say at this point, you are pushing, after searching and kind of recapping your findings and everybody kind of just, just hanging out, pushing probably about quarter to eight, closer to eight at this point. And is the sun gone down? It is on its way. Yes. Should we get, get ready? Yeah, I mean, do we want to check out 10B first? We we went we to 10B, well. but well, to go again. Yeah, to go again. check and see if anything's changed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, doesn't make no sense, but yeah. What does? All right. We head on up there. Yeah, Cassandra will leave most of her kit down there, but she'll actually take her camera. Um as well as some spare gloves and, uh, and of course, her gun. Now, what have you been doing with the things that you find? Are you kind of bagging them up and putting them in the box, or are you taking them with you? Bagging them up, anything that's of it, that seemed like it's important, like the receipts and the stationery, she is bagging up and keeping on her kit so that she can bring them back to the hotel room to put it with everything else. Got it. Okay. All right. So you all secure Abigail's apartment behind you, and as a group, make your way up to the third floor to apartment 10B and with the door now standing wide open and unable to be secured due to the just complete destruction of the door jam. You kind of stand and watch and wait as it gets darker and darker until finally the sun sets and there is no change. Well, uh, to the roof then. I'm going to go in and just take one, like, step inside, take one quick little look around just to, like, be 100% sure. I was going to say, if we're standing outside the apartment, I think when Jenny goes to step inside the apartment, Iroh will actually put his arm out and then just stick his head in the room and look side to side to make sure there's no one in there first before putting his arm down and stepping to the side for her. Yeah, you see, you see nothing. Uh, it doesn't look like it's been disturbed or you don't get that sensation that somebody is inside or you know definitely don't see anybody 
And Jenny, when you step inside and kind of give it a very quick uh, once over, nothing stands out as out of the ordinary. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Very sheepishly and swallowing a bit of her courage into her, Cassandra will start to head upstairs. Okay. Who's opening the door? Ira would like to, but he won't push someone else out of the way or whatever if they're... I mean, Mark would probably go up front and open the door. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I'd say that it's... In fact, Mark, you probably see that she... Cassandra wants to open the door, um, but she's keeping her hand extended and it's it's quivering a bit. There's this definite sense of hesitation to her body language. Yeah, and I'd say Jenny is standing back by Ira even. She's <laughs> not rushing forward for it. Okay. All right. Well, I think Mark Mark would definitely notice this with his human, but totally, totally. Yeah, I would. I I won't even make you roll for that because that's such an obvious indicator. Yeah, he he just turns to Cassandra and says, uh, "You ready for this? Might be nothing. Could be nothing. I don't know if. Uh, I don't know. Let's just open the door, I guess. All right." And he throws open the door. The door opens on the smoking lounge. You see Cassandra's head just drop. And the pit of her stomach just sinks. And she's just standing there in the doorway for a moment. Uh, Nightfall it is, I guess. Oh, look who's back. Hey, you Mark. How's it going? (laughs) I can't complain. How about you, huh? Well... A bit confused, but... What about? I mean, this place, the people around it. Nah, don't think too hard about it. This place is aces, huh? Why don't you get yourself a drink? Clear everything up in no time, huh? No, uh, not for me, Mark. Lips that touch liquor will never touch mine. Dad, uh, he just kind of waves you off and goes back to his own drink, chewing the cigar, the unlit cigar in his mouth. Excuse me. Oh, yeah, what's up, Dollface? Mark, was it correct? Y'all been here enough. I think you'd remember my name by now. Yeah, Mark Rourke. What year is it? What year is it? What fucking question is that? It's a very simple question. Oh. Oh, listen, lady, no need to be rude, all right? It's, uh, it's 1933. Cassandra turns back and looks at the others when he says that. Yeah, and there were, I don't recall any 1930s dates. Is that accurate of the stuff we found? That's accurate, yeah. Well, you all introduce yourselves to the night manager yet? I'm sorry, who? Who would that be? Mr. Castain, the night manager. I told you about it, and he looks, he looks over at you, Jenny. She says nothing. <laughs> Cassandra whips her head back to Jenny. I'm definitely looking at Jenny to see what her reaction is. Um, no, I haven't met the night manager. I don't know if y'all are going to be, I don't know if y'all are going to be spending more time up here and, you know, just common courtesy. That's all I'm saying. You may just want to poke your head and say hello. Where should we poke our head into? I'll take you if you want. Cassandra looks back at Jenny again. What? Please, uh, show us the way. All right. All right. And Mark will kind of hoist his, himself out of his chair and gesture for you all to follow him. And he'll lead you out into the hallways. And it seems like he knows exactly where he's going. Do you all follow? Cassandra will look back at Ira to see what his take on this is. Ira doesn't have any noticeable change to his facial expression, but you can tell, or you probably could tell, I think you all have pretty high human. His body is quite tense. Like his muscles look very locked up and his eyes are kind of darting about the room, like checking corners and stuff like that. He's also going to, as they move towards, uh, he's going to follow them when they go. But as soon as they start walking, he's going to lean over to say something to Jenny. Uh, So yeah, before we start to follow Mark, Cassandra will turn back to Ira. Keep us safe then, right? I'm trying. Yeah, Cassandra will start to follow Mark. All right. Dyra, what do you speak with Jenny about? Did you come here without us? She, there's a very long pause, which is probably an answer enough. She's kind of trying to weigh if it's better to be 
honest or to lie, but then she'll just kind of give a small nod. Please don't do that again. And then he's eyes forward. Yeah, she does not respond, but <laughs> she takes it to heart. So Mark leads you down the hallway, just a few doors down, not very far, and knocks on the door. And eventually a old man, a diminutive man with a shock of white hair, answers the door. Yes, Mr. Rourke. Hey, Mr. Castain, I got some visitors for you. They've been they've been popping in. I thought it would be good for them to come and say hello. He kind of looks at you all with these big, almost Coke bottle glasses. Yes, and who might you be? Uh, my name is Madison. Madison. Can you tell us about this place? Well, what do you want to know? Cassandra looks back at Mark. Well, I mean, uh, by, by the way, I'm, I'm Meshach. Meshach. I say, you aren't by any any coincidence related to a, a man named uh, Augustus Castain or Gabriel. He kind of puffs up a little bit and says, uh, I come from a long and distinguished line of Castains. Come, if you wish to ask questions, let us speak in... In my parts, but yes, you will come inside. I would prefer to stay out here. I would prefer to sit down. I am a very old man. You have a fair point. Is the read on everybody? Let's go. <laughs> Mark looks excited to see what's inside this apartment. He is deferring to you guys this time. She'll take your lead. I mean, I was going to give a small shake of his head, but I think that's pretty much par for the course. He doesn't want us yeah. to do it. <laughs> we, we, it's, yeah. Um, He's expecting your natural lesson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cassandra will just turn to Mark and without saying it, just sort of glance at him and, you know, as a, almost giving him the authority now, passing the torch. So, Mr. Castain, you don't, you don't have any uh, strange clockwork contraptions in that apartment of yours, do you? That is a very odd and specific question, my friend. But well, no. I, it's it's just that I mean that's kind of what your family's famous for, right? He kind of just shrugs. Are you coming inside or not? Mark kind of like peeks inside. Do I see any, anything waiting to kill me? No, no. You just see uh, an unkempt apartment. Just lots of newspapers, lots of magazines, some photos on the wall. Um, nothing, nothing out of, too out of the ordinary. I mean, all things considered. I, yeah. When Mark steps in. Yeah, gum, gum. He walks with this shuffling limp. He is obviously an old, old man. He has this white unkempt hair, like a, almost a shorter ailing Einstein. But he leads you in and he takes a seat in an easy chair near a coffee table. It's stacked high with these old newspapers. Can I just quickly, what are like some of the years on the newspapers? Are they 1990 or no. 1920? Some of the ones that you see just with a quick glance, you're seeing dates like 1932, 1940, 1923. Mm -hmm. There is one headline that kind of stands out to you as being slightly odd. It's a New York Tribune newspaper from July 1923, that says Russo-Germanic Pact crumbles, Vienna liberated. All right. Mark will, if there's a place to sit, he will take a seat. Otherwise, stand. I will say roll sand, just because the sheer volume and age of some of these newspapers is nothing short of just almost overwhelming. Yeah, this is weird. Oh, that's a failure. 79 out of 70. You just lose. You just lose one. All right. So yeah, there is a, a couch, and you have to do have to move some newspapers and magazines over to take a seat. But he gestures for you to sit down. I think yeah, uh, probably as he's clearing off the newspapers, he sees this uh, old 1923 headline, and and just stops for a second and says, "How long you been collecting these?" 
as long as I have had the forethought to do so. What do you, wait for forethought? What are, what are you holding on to these for? Good to remember. Ah, uh, I. So, Mister Castain, I mean, you see, Mark says you're you're the guy to talk to up here. I am the night manager. Yes. What's what's that mean exactly, night man? I mean, is there a day manager? He shrugs. There is a superintendent. I am the night manager. Who's the superintendent then? Do do we need to meet them too? He is the superintendent. He meets those he wishes to meet. He does not meet those he does not wish to meet. That is why I am the night manager. So this superintendent guy doesn't have a first name. He shrugs. Does he live in the building in the premises? He lives in the upper floors. He is having a party tonight. What is this place? I am not sure I understand your question. I want to humid that. <laughs> Matt, go for it. Mr. Castain, how long have you been here? Ah, with a six out of 74, he doesn't know how to take that question. Okay. Almost as, almost as if there's nothing unusual about it to him. But he looks at you, uh, Cassie. And he says, I have been here for as long as I can remember. Yes, but what year did you get here? He shrugs. Mr. Castain, are you familiar with one of your residents, Abigail Wright? I am indeed, yes, familiar with Miss Wright. Look, we're looking for her. Uh, do you think you could uh, introduce us to her? I don't know her well enough to introduce her to anyone, but she is quiet. She pays on time each month in cash. Have you spoken with the other tenants? I mean, some of them. Uh, like who? He shrugs. Can you show us her, where her room is, or even where the superintendent's room is? I'm afraid that is not possible. Well, why not? You're the night manager. I have other properties to attend to. Is there any way that we could perhaps make it worth your while? He, he cracks a smile and has this like dry, throaty chuckle. No. No, I'm afraid not. When you say other properties, what do you mean by that? Other apartments. This is a very large building and I must take care of all of them. Familiar with the theory of perpetual motion? I cannot say I am, no. It's funny, I studied the work of one Gabriel Castain, and it seems to, I mean, rumor has it, even though it's theoretically impossible, physically speaking, he cracked the code. I was just wondering, you know, since you sound like you're a descendant from him if maybe something like that had been passed down um, i'm afraid not when my family left perhaps i did not fall into the family trade but i i've never had much propensity for mechanics i know enough to fix the plumbing and fix the wiring but i do not construct is this one of their constructions? You just maintain it? No, no. This site, to be honest, I couldn't tell you who built the building. I just, I maintain it on behalf of the superintendent. He can be at the party tonight? He's always at the party. She kind of looks over at the others. What is this party for? What's it celebrating? He shrugs. Are you not invited? I have work to do. And... My days of attending parties and galas is long behind me. How can we attend this party? <laughs> you do not. Yeah, you hear a snort from Mark when he hears that. We're not even tenants and you asked to attend party. <laughs> no. 
how does one become a tenant if we wanted to? When it is time. How do you know when it's time? You know. You are close. M me? You. And your friend. He points at you, Cassandra. Her eyes go wide a bit. I'm sorry? He shrugs. You are the type of people the superintendent takes an interest in. What does that mean? What type of people? He shrugs. <laughs> is anybody looking around while they're they're talking? Yeah, I was going to say, when he's talking to Jenny, Cassandra would like to snoop around the apartment if it's possible. Okay. Yeah, there, there's a there's a couple of closed doors uh, that you assume would probably lead to a bedroom or a, or a bathroom, but you know, there's still just these newspapers everywhere, these magazines, uh, photos on the wall, black and white photographs on the wall. I think, like, Ira's going to be keeping an eye on the entrances and the doors, and he's likely going to inadvertently see a couple of the pictures. I'm um, just uh, scanning the room. Yeah. Um, so there are these kind of like black and white photos of, of these bombed out cities with these kind of senseless inscriptions, downtown tulips, sovereign carriage. Others are these photos of these indeterminate battlefields with groups of people, potentially refugees, just all over the place. Would he recognize any of them? I, I mean, like, he's an army dude. I don't know how much of a World War I buff he is, but is there anything distinctive? Vaguely European. About the right time frame, uh, clothing-wise, for World War I? No. Some, some of this is, some of the clothing you see is not what anything you're familiar with, with your background in the military. Oh. Uh, he tries to bury that thought. Roll sand. Do it! <laughs> yeah. Join the club. Okay. Ooh! You lose one with an 82 out of 73. The headline I noticed was about a Frankish Russo. Russo Germanic. A Russo Germanic, yeah. Germanic pact. And the liberation of Vienna. Russo-Germanic Pact crumbles, Vienna liberated. Okay. Just looking at that, I mean, does this um, does this track with some with something that I know happened in 1923? Roll intelligence. All right. And for you, Ira, like some of these uniforms you're seeing, they're like black uniforms with small red fezes, they're almost Turkish kind of, but not quite. It's very, it's very strange. Okay, so are we talking like Turkish, but not quite as in like World War I era Ottoman Empire or? Maybe. And there are also these garish red military uniforms as well. Hmm. But for you, Mark, with a 14 out of 90, you paid attention to your some of your history classes. Uh, you know, not enough to maybe take a test tomorrow, but none of this sounds familiar. Mark's going to turn to uh, Mr. Castain and say, you mind if I, if I read one of your newspapers? By all means. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the article. I mean, is this, is this nonsense? Is it, is it something that, I mean, it sounds to me like this is definitely something that didn't happen. It's something that didn't happen, but it's almost impossible for this to be a fake right the age and everything they talk about th this conflict that did couldn't possibly have happened because you know in u.s history it would have been in the interim between world war one and world war two right and how world war one essentially might have just continued with different parties with different different alliances different uh theaters of combat none of this makes sense but these are i mean it, it is it is impossible for these to be fraudulent, for these to be fakes. And if they are fakes, they are top notch and this apartment is full of them. Yeah, I'm just gonna motion Jenny over and say, take a look at this. I'll come over and take a look. With your history, you've got what, an 80? History is 70. Not, this never happened. What is, what am I looking at here, Meshach? 
I mean, it's just one of the newspapers around here. I think I would have thought I would have heard about that. Well, this didn't happen. Roll sand. <laughs> Both of us? You already rolled once before. Oh, um, I okay. first, yeah. Right. Ooh. Fail. 95 out of 63, you lose one. I see the perplexed look on Jenny's face, and I go, well, well, I mean, it's not the strangest thing we've seen in here, but Mr. Castaigne, there's a lot of, lot of things that are different about this place you manage, wouldn't you say? No. No. Well, I was afraid you were going to say that. Is Weird Mark still here? Oh, he left. No, he went back. He, he went back. Okay. Uh, so Ira is just like eyes locked on Mr. Casting. While they're talking, is it possible that I can try and sneak away one of the newspapers? Just uh, one of them that looks a little bit older. Rolls. Uh, are, are you looking at them as well? I am, yeah. First roll sand, then roll stealth. Oh, great. Cool. Uh, so if he makes any, I know he's a really old man, but if he makes any moves or anything, Ira will. Get to punch him. Okay. Uh, it's a success. Yep. You So 45 out of 54, you lose nothing. And then roll stealth. All right. This is going to be good. No. No. <laughs> 48. 46 out of 11. Uh, Mr. Castaigne's head suddenly turns in your direction and says, I would very much appreciate it if you would leave those where you found them. Please and thank you. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. I forgot my manners. Evidently. Is there anything else I can do to assist any of you? Look, Mark Rourke seemed to seem to think it was important that we meet you. I mean, is there, can you show us around? Can you tell us the rules? What we should and shouldn't do? You seem familiar enough with the rules already, and I'm afraid I do not have the time nor the inclination to escort you around my property. If it is, uh, Mr. Rourke said it was a good idea for you to meet me, if it was only because evidently you have been spending some time here. And I like to know who is wandering the halls of my property. Well, Marcus, that's it then. Yeah, Mark is just thinking. I hate to just keep asking you questions out of the blue, Mr. Castain, but I read somewhere that Asa Darabondi was architect of this place. Did you know Mr. Darabondi? I have seen him. I do not know him. Is he here? He shrugs. Your resident? Not here. Then where? Elsewhere. Do you know where elsewhere? He shrugs. Is he at the Hotel Broad album? They brodled in. Perhaps. Look, how would one get to the Hotel Bro Broadle bin? You will find it when the time is right. You don't have an address or nothing? You will find it when the time is right and when it wants to be found. I think Mark just kind of stands up and holds out a hand to shake Mr. Castaigne's hand. Yeah, uh, Mr. Castaigne stands and puts his, a very limp, very weak hand that feels like dried papyrus and just gives you just a very faint handshake. Well, it's uh, been enlightening. Thank you for meeting with, with me, sir. Any, any, we ready to go, everybody? Yes. Yep. All right. Let's, uh, uh, Mark, will, Mark will walk out the door. Yep, I follow. Yeah, uh, Cassandra will nod, but won't take his hand to shake or anything like that, but she'll just follow after Mark. When we get out in the hall, Mark's going to say, you know, I mean, I, th I think we got to... We just just got to find uh, Abigail. We just got to try. I could make him tell us where she is if you want. Uh, like the last guy? 
I didn't need him to tell me anything. It would be different. Okay, well, the rules of reality don't operate the same way here. I would be concerned about what would happen if you went ballistic on him. I don't go ballistic. Cassandra turns around as they're talking, and she tests the doorknob of the night manager's door. Is it locked? Nope. She opens it. Uh, Mr. Castain turns back around. This is rude to open a door that's... I'm sorry, I think I I forgot something. And uh, she'll look back, uh, sort of guilty in the face towards the others, like she wasn't expecting this. But she'll head in and head back towards the spot around the couch and just do this, you know, fake once over. And uh, I'm sorry, I I thought I left it out there. Uh, Forgive us. Uh, And uh, she'll start to walk back out. Pyra's going to give Cassandra a kind of questioning look. Like tilt his head and then kind of motion towards the old man. Mr. Castine shuts the door and you hear the lock of the deadbolt. Listen, last time I saw something come out of a room, when I opened the door, it was just a broom closet. So I just wanted to make sure that that was what we experienced. And now what? Well, the way I see it, so we... Mr. Castain brought up a good point. We haven't really talked to any of the other residents except for Manuel. But we could try talking to them. You want to just go knocking on doors? Yeah, I mean... Do you think he meant the tenants down below? I hope so. If people don't know what's going on, let's not inform them. I think they do. But, I mean, the other thing, I mean, we tried looking for uh, Abigail once, right? But maybe we just didn't. Seems like you got to get lucky to find things around here. Maybe we just didn't get lucky enough. Uh, Out of character, did we ever figure out who Michelle was? Van Fitz. Okay, so back in character. Well, uh, Van Fitz, uh, the one who lives down below. She was in that in that screenplay that I found. We should at least ask her and see what she knows. Yeah, I I totally agree. I think we should we should just talk to some people. And the people downstairs are seem like a lot less creepy than the ones around here. Sandra turns back down the hall the way they came. Is there a hall still there? Yeah, there's a hall. Yeah. Okay. But we can't see the smoking room from here. No. No, of course not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just checking. Cassandra will start to walk back towards the... the. Just She'll follow the path that they took uh, to get there. Start to walk back. Roll sand. <sighs> 35 out of 54. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Lose one stand or one willpower. And what is willpower for again? That is essentially for, to, to prevent you from getting exhausted. Okay. So you, you regen uh, willpower uh, when you sleep. Gotcha. Okay. But not sand. Uh, I don't know which one's more fun. Uh, we'll go with sand. Okay. And once again, the, the hallway seems to elongate before you and stretch and lengthen. The shadows grow darker, the door is more numerous, and it feels like you haven't moved. I, I, this is where we came from. This is what happened. It takes a while. What do you mean it takes a while? By the way, there is a sudden chime that sounds like a giant bell. And it reverberates off the walls and in your ears to the point where you almost have to clasp your hands over them just to just to negate the sound as it rattles your brains and rattles your skulls. Roll sand. All of us? Yeah. Got a 69 out of 69, Maybe. man. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Jenny with a 68 out of 62, you lose one. Cassandra with a 12 out of 54, you lose nothing. 
Mark with a 69 out of 69, you lose nothing. And Ira with a 79 out of 72, you lose one. Suddenly, Cassandra, you look over and there's a perpendicular hallway far ahead. And you see a group of people running, wearing silver robes and white masks. Cassandra, are they running towards us? They're it's they're running kind of in the uh, across that hallway across your field of vision going from okay. left to right. Gotcha. Cassandra just instinctively puts her hand on Desert Holster and draws her gun, but doesn't point it. But she does keep the gun at her side and starts to recoil back into Ira and and Mark. Do we see this, or is it just her? No, well, everybody sees it. Oh, anybody okay. who's anybody's looking. Ira will step to the side to let Cassandra kind of move past so he can put his body in front of or in between uh, that and the rest of the people. And he'll also have his gun out in his hand. Yeah, Mark's uh, hand immediately goes to his gun when he sees Cassandra draw. They're gone. They were in white robes and silver masks. Silver robes and white masks. Silver robes and white masks. Like what we found like, earlier. Like Like the robes we found earlier. I was uh, going to turn and look at Jenny and go, next time I see one of those people, I'm going to have to do something about it, and I need you to be okay with that. Um, I'm, I might not be okay with it, but do what you have to do. We're in a lot of danger. I get that. I get that. But you can't just ask me to, you can't just say, hey, I might kill someone. You have to be fine with that. I won't stop you, but I might not be fine with it. Just being honest. Jenny, I don't care about your emotions. I mean, I need you to keep moving. Yeah, I, I gathered. Good. Cassandra breaks away and rushes up to the hallway that they were, had just disappeared down, and she looks in the direction to see if they're still there, if they've disappeared. There is nothing. Is it just a dead end, or is it break off into any more hallways? Nope. Yeah, there's. It's definitely it, the hallway continues on both sides, but you see no one. Yeah, you guys would see her dip out down the hall, and she's going to follow. Okay. Well, uh, there's no one to follow. Well, the, she's going to follow the same path to see if she'll hit this this last bend, and if there's nothing there, she'll come back. But gotcha. Okay. Yeah, you move briskly, trying to catch any sign of this group any glimpse of a trailing robe or a discarded mask, and there is nothing. Yeah, Cassandra looks almost disappointed, but also relieved, and she'll, less briskly than she came, uh, she'll go back to the party. Well, that didn't work. Maybe if we try going towards uh, Abigail. Jenny, it seems that you've been here, maybe perhaps more than us, so do you have any tips? Do you have any tricks just try to concentrate on where you're trying to get to i know that sounds dumb and unhelpful but it's what seemed to work for me eventually might take some time these aren't like this hall may have been north 10 seconds ago but it might not be north anymore so just going the direction back where we came isn't gonna fix it it's Things are weird here. You have to conceptualize where you want to go. So where do we want to go? Do we want to just leave or do we want to look for Abigail? You all know what I want, but I'll leave it to you. Well, uh, Sandra has a job. She came to do it. Uh, she's going to start to walk. And as she's walking, she'll think about Abigail and try and focus her intuition into finding her. Okay. Yeah, you begin walking down these hallways and do you just kind of go with your gut and just take turns as, as they feel right? Yeah, that, but I'm also still kind of like doing what Jenny said where I'm, I'm concentrating on, on the goal of finding her, her apartment. Okay. As you turn a corner, you see kind of in the midpoint in the hallway, you see a medical table just in the middle of this ostensibly normal hallway and there's a man on it in his 30s tied down mumbling to himself Cassandra stops just within an earshot though do the, do we understand what he's saying do we get any of the words 
You do. He's he's saying things like, where am I? I don't know where I am. How did I get here? I want to go home. Does he look familiar to any of us? Like, do no. we see his picture? Okay. Sir? Hello? Oh my god, you 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 have you have to help me. My, you have to get me out of here. She kind of looks back at the others. Like she goes to take a step forward and then kind of looks back at the others to see if they're gonna if they have opinions. <laughs> yeah, Mark comes forward. He's being held down by like straps. Right. Can can I untie those? You can try. Yeah, when those two look back to or when Jenny looks back to see how uh, everybody else is reacting. Ira's gonna level his gun at the guy, but then give her a nod, like, go ahead. My, my, my name is my name is Vega. Vega, uh, you you have to get me out of here. Tied you up like this? I, I don't, I don't know. I don't Doctors. The... How is he dressed? Like, does he look like he's from the 90s, or does it look like it's a 1930s or older situation? It's hard to tell. They're kind of like, like scrubs, like patient scrubs. Is the medical table itself antique? It's 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 hard to tell. It's kind of okay. just like a me, a metal table. Okay. It looks new. Okay. Well, Mr. Vega, um, where where do you think you are? I I don't know. I I, and suddenly, the floor opens, Ooh. and the entire table begins to retract slowly into it, almost like quicksand. Right. Try to pull him off. Yeah, try to undo the strap. I don't have a knife. If Jenny is in within reach of Ira, he's going to reach out and try and physically restrain her from moving towards the table. Okay. You go ahead and roll roll strength or uh, roll unarmed. Jenny, you can roll dodge if you're trying to get away from Ira. Yeah, I think it's less trying to get away and more that she wants to help this man not fall into the floor. So yeah, she right. rolls out dodge. And then Mark, roll strength. Just to uh, try and take these things off. Right. Oh, that's not good. That's not too bad. A 14 out of 60. Right. So, Ira, with a 59 out of 80, you manage to get a hold of Jenny as she tries to get out of the way. But with an 86 out of 31, she's just not quick enough to get at those restraints. And so you put a hand on her shoulder and kind of hold her back. Mark, you reach down and you're able to get one off. But this man starts screaming hysterically as the floor just opens up into this hole and he just slowly recedes into it and you hear his screams all the way down as he begins to fall and fall and fall until silence. What does the pit look like? Is it like, is there like clockwork gears? Does it look mechanical? Does it look, just look like a void? Are you looking down? Yeah. <laughs> you see a distant pale face with empty eye sockets looking back up at you from an impossible distance. She freaks and slams her back against the wall as soon as she sees it. Roll sand. Ugh. Oh, success. 47 out of 53. Very nice. You lose, uh, you lose nothing. Yeah, but she's, she's very shaken right now. Once it's done, Jenny tries to like push Ira's hand off of her. Yeah, as soon as the as soon as the hole in the ground closes up, Myra lets her go. What the hell? We could have helped him. He just gives her like a blank look. Stares right back for a second, and there's like this moment where she, there's like this almost it's like somewhere between resignation and like giving up, just kind of accepting that no matter what she says, she is never going to get through to Ira. <laughs> so, yeah, she just turns around and is everyone okay? Fine. They're gone. I, I, I mean, that guy just got swallowed up right in front of us. Yeah, he sure fucking did. Actually, I'm sorry. Everybody rolls in. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> from, seeing, from seeing that shit, yeah. 25 out of 69. And Jenny with, with a 21 out of 61. And Ira with Ooh. a 6 out of 71. Uh, you all lose nothing. Very nice. All right, so what do you all do next? I guess we just keep walking. Like, is everyone still on board with trying to find Abigail or what? He's down. What's the attitude here? We should leave. There it is. <laughs> I mean, what's the point of leaving if we just 
are going to come back anyway. I feel like we just keep going in and out and in and out. Shouldn't we just stay until we get what we need? I was going to kind of tilt his head to this like side to side as in like, that's not a terrible point, but he doesn't actually respond. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Either we find Abigail or we have at least some kind of definite conclusion as to what happened to her as best as we can. If any more pits open in the floor, please don't rush towards them. I was trying to help him. That guy's stuck in some fucked up 1930s limbo in a straitjacket now, probably. We don't even know if he's real. We don't know that he's not. We're real and we're here. Ira looks at everyone else suspiciously. <laughs> <laughs> Raises his gun. Existential crisis. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, Cassandra's just got a thousand yards stare now. My job isn't to save these people; it's to protect you. Please don't make it any more difficult than it needs to be. So you've said. Jenny, do you want to die? No, but I want to find Abigail. Mark. Yeah. You've been quiet. I'm. Um, look, I. I think every time we come back here, judging from what we've seen so far, something weird's going to happen to us. So maybe, maybe we should just try to limit the number of times we come back. We're here now. I say we press on. Agreed. Irish shrug. I'm going to regret this, aren't I? Yeah, uh, Cassandra will follow. Yeah, who's leading? <laughs> I guess Cassandra. <laughs> well, the, you know, I mean, just kind of look at each other. the best <laughs> one to lead, right? Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, we all just have that moment where we look to each other to see if we're one of us is actually going to move, and then finally, after a few seconds, Cassandra breaks away and starts to head down the hall. You come to a dead end, and there are there's another hallway. That branches off, but at this juncture, you notice this long crack in the plaster between the ceiling and the wall. I am I able to touch it? Do you want to? Um, well, actually, you know what? I'll take out my little flashlight, you know, the little skinny ones that they give. Yeah, the pen light, yeah, the pen light. Yeah, I'll take my pen light out and I'll just start to flash it in the crack to see if I see anything. Yeah, it's tough to see. You kind of have to s s stand up on your tiptoes a bit. It's You don't really see anything in there. It, it seems dark. I'm going to put the... I'm gonna actually going to toss the pen light down to Jenny. Yeah, I'll take it. And you said it's where the roof meets the wall, right? Right, yeah. It's, it's in the uh, plaster between the ceiling and the wall. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and climb up on... Whatever might be available to me, you know, like maybe if there's like a, a nightstand or something like that. If not, I reckon uh, make that. I'll put his hands together for like a. Okay, even better. Yeah, so give me a hand. Uh, and when he ushers, when when she when he comes over to her, she is gonna put her fingertips to the ceiling, and you'd see her close her eyes and start to just like go into this deep concentration. As soon as your fingers touch that crack. And everyone sees this. The everything around you, the entire hallway just falls away like a house of cards. And you look down and you find yourself standing on a stage. Those of you who look around or look back see the hallway, but now it's a painted plywood backdrop. You look back and in the audience, there is an audience. And rows upon rows of seats, you see hundreds of these human-sized marionettes staring mutely at you. Strings running up into the dark above. Everyone rolls in. Oh, shit. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> That's the creepiest fucking thing I've ever heard of. Dang. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm out. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> this is the thing that could have happened. Can I just say, I want to say it before, but I didn't want to interrupt Cassandra. As Ira's moving towards Cassandra to, like, make the little hand net thing that, what do you call that? I don't know, to boost her up or whatever. He stops partway, turns around, looks at Jenny and points his finger at her and goes, don't run away. And then keeps going and holds his hands out for Cassandra. Okay. 
Nowhere for her to go now. Okay. Yeah. So, Jenny, with a 100 out of 61, 80. you lose six. Yeah. Unless you project. Mark, with a 75 out of 69, roll 1d6. Cassie, with a 4 out of 53, you lose one. And Ira, with an 84 out of 71, roll 1d6. I got a one. You lose one, Sam. Okay. Ira, you lose two. Jenny, what are you doing? I think I got to project because otherwise I hit my breaking point. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you... So do, do all six have to go to one bond or can I split them up between bonds? How does that one work? One bond. One bond. Yeah, one bond. Can you only project four? Yeah, it's 1d4. Yeah, it's only one. Oh, I so I roll 1d4 and out of the six. Yep, roll 1d4. And then you will reduce your bond and your willpower by that much. Okay. So, yeah, with a two. So you only lose four sanity. So you don't go temporarily insane. And you subtract two from your willpower and one bond. Okay. Who are, I just had a curiosity, who are you subtracting that from? My mom. Okay. But you all gaze out upon this sea of these frozen marionette faces stretching out into the darkness ahead of you. What do you do? Cassandra is trembling right now, turning very slowly back towards the audience. Uh, as she's looking over the audience uh, of marionettes, do any of the faces look familiar? They are just blank, wooden, carved puppet faces. Fantastic. Jenny, like, she didn't turn around to look at the hall behind her, but she, like, tried to back up because she wanted to be as far away from this as possible, and her back kind of hits the wall, and she has just this moment of abject terror on her face that she quickly tries to get control of, but is struggling. Mark Mark is uh, looking around the room, and but especially more at the stage. One, look, looking for a way out, obviously, but two looking for any sign or mention of a de Craig. Because so far from what we've seen, these things seem to be connected to these people we've read about. And de Craig was definitely somebody who did, you know, stuff with the stage. Yeah, with a with a with a 70 alertness mark, you don't see anything. Okay. But yeah. What were you gonna say, Ira? I was just gonna say Ira like almost like hangs his head. Uh, like he looks exhausted. And there is like, obviously when the, you know, the stage appears or whatever, there is a moment of genuine surprise on his face. Cause I don't think no matter how blank faced you are, you probably can't stop, stop that from scaring the shit out of you. But yeah, he just looks exhausted. As you all begin moving around, you notice that the marionette faces are turning to watch as you all move about the stage. Ira's going to fire at one. Okay, roll firearms. The 79 out of 80, yeah. Your weapon bucks in your hand, and there's this huge plume of smoke. The recoil feels odd, and the, the amount of smoke that is discharged from the end of this weapon is not what you're used to seeing. Your muscle memory kicks in, and you think, maybe this, this has to be a stoppage, this has to be... Maybe it was a squib, maybe it was a bat round, and you eject the magazine and you look down and there are caps in your magazine. He'll pull out one of his backup clips and see if that's good or not. There are also caps. Fuck. Stage bullets. Roll sand. And he's audibly gonna say, fuck. Yeah, you lose uh you lose one. Hey, uh Vince, it'd be super cool if you could stop. Stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> You can project. No, I like Aaron. I don't want to project. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll literally never project. On, on. I don't think that's a stupid idea for me to make that that way. <laughs> As the smoke clears, you, you hear the clack of wood and you notice that these hundreds upon hundreds of hands of marionette hands are clapping in the audience. Does it look like there's any exit? Not that you can tell, right, from where you are, from your position, yeah. with these with these lights shining in your face. Because there are stage lights hanging above you, yeah, shining down sense. on your positions, yeah. Jenny is positioning herself close to Ira as they start clapping. 
I turn to uh, Cassie and I say, do you, do you have that uh, that script you found? And she, yeah, uh, and she'll start to rifle through her, her kit bag and uh, pull out some of the script. Can, can I see it? Yeah, she only took a, I think she took only that page and maybe a couple other pages, but she didn't take the entire thing. Right. But yeah, she'll hand her hand him the page that she has. All right. I look at the page and start from the top and I kind of like point to where I am and what I'm reading. So I'm going to read like one of the parts from the play. Okay. And then I point to the next line after I finish reading that and show it to Cassie. Yeah, so if that's what y'all want to do, assign, uh, you should still have it in your handouts. Oh, is it in our handouts? It is, yep. Okay. There's a, a C word in there. You can feel free to make that a B word. All right, so I will, I'll start with Mark because that's the first person talking. I say, Abigail is gone. She moved upstairs today. And then I, I point to the next line which is Thomas. Yeah, looks confused for a moment. Uh, seeing that it's a male part, she'll just instinctively look back at, look back at Ira. All right, I'll show it to Ira. Uh, Ira's not looking at you guys. He's, yeah, I didn't think Ira would play along. <laughs> no, he's put his uh, body in between you guys and the crowd, specifically standing so that he's in between Jenny and the nearest marionette. But he's not looking or paying attention to what you're doing at all. Towards us or towards the audience? No, he's looking out towards the crowd to see if any of them move. Jim, okay. uh, but he's got his body positioned so that Jenny is directly behind him. So Mark moves just like like he's standing facing one direction and he just moves over and, and he's facing 45 degrees, you know, like he's just taking up a different spot. He goes, and? And he moves back to the place he was. He says, I miss the kid. Then... I point to the line for Michelle and show it to Kathy. Um, uh, her dad, that pig, came around. She doesn't like you, Mark. No one likes you. Anyway, she ran off with that salesman. Everyone knows it. Oh, fuck you, you uh, bad person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on. And then I, he moves over 45 degrees and says, come on, guys, come on. There's a bark from offstage. There is a bark from offstage. I I don't want the next line to happen. (laughs) There's a bark from offstage, and you hear somebody from offstage making the sounds of these footsteps. And those who happen to look over see two marionette stagehands standing silently in the darkness watching you. Uh, Who is that? I think all of us are stopping and listening. (laughs) I point to the the line from Michelle and show it to Cassie. Um, uh, who could be down there? Uh, who is that? I step over to the doorway and lean to look down the stairs. Hello? Hello? At this point, the marionettes applaud again. The strings above them as they fade into the darkness, jerking as something manipulates those hands into applause. And as the applause dies down, they stand and start to file out to these doors to the side, on the left and on the right, opening up into some brightly lit hallway. And they begin to leave. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a way out. All right, now you, you all thought I was crazy, didn't you? But it yes. worked. And Mark is going to head towards the right, the door on the right side. Okay. Who's following him? Sandra is. Okay. Jenny is sticking with Ira. Wherever Ira's going, Jenny is going. So if he stays put, she stays put. <laughs> so uh, he'll, he'll put a hand on her back just gently to kind of coax her forward and then fall behind. Mark, as you broach the threshold, you see the diminutive form of Mr. Castain standing there. Waiting for you. Well, um, everything all right, Mr. Canstain? I do believe it is time for you to leave the premises. Allow me to escort you back to the smoking lounge. I trust you all know the way 
from there. Mark looks disappointed, but he turns to the rest of the people and he's like shrugs his shoulders, says, I think we probably should. Where's Abigail? She's gone, Cassandra. We need to go. Everyone is exactly where they want and are meant to be. The superintendent has decided against accepting new tenants at this time. But perhaps in the future, he may reconsider. Are people here real? They are more real than anything outside, Ms. Archer. Your father sends his regards. She breaks down crying. Like silently, but she is crying at this point. I will put a hand on her shoulder. You have seen all you have were meant to see. It is time to go. Let's go. And Mr. Castain will lead you all for those who follow. Cassandra will follow, but she's definitely got this expression of defeat almost on her face, like disappointment. Mr. Castine moves almost too slowly, his feet shuffling against the carpet. And the progress is slow, but he seems to know exactly where he's going. Each turn, sure and considered. There are stairs suddenly that lead down. He takes you down. And you don't know how long you walk, still reeling from what you just witnessed. But eventually you do end up back at that threshold to the smoking lounge. I'm sure we'll see you again. I am sure you will. Is Mark here? He is. And is uh, so is Roger Caroon. When we walk into the smoking lounge, does Mark say anything to us? He does not. There's no like, hey, friends. No, he seems lost in one of the books. Cassandra's going to actually very slowly start to step away from the others. And you said there's, there's like a bar, ta- like a bar top here. There is. She's going to walk towards the bar top and take a seat. Or not like a bar. It's like, I'm sorry. It's like a wet, it's like a bar cart. Like a. Oh, okay. Like, I got you. All right. Never mind. Not like a bar cart. Like a, um, I guess it is like a bar. Yeah. So you can take a seat. Sure. But Mr. Castain will look over and say, I do believe your way ahead lies downstairs, Miss Reese. She relaxes almost as she's just sit down. And when he speaks up, she tenses back up again and starts to swivel out of the chair and steps up. There's no one that came to the bar, right? You mean... Like a bartender or anything like that? No, no, no. It's it's essentially like a, a serve yourself kind of deal. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. She'll uh, she'll get up and start to walk back towards the others. Actually, she'll walk, start to walk towards the, the door. I will clarify. You did not use your real names when you introduced yourselves to him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I think Mark's already at the top of the stairs. Cassie's there as well. Yeah, Jenny's, she's ready to go. <laughs> now that we're all ready to go, now is, is the time for Ira to say, no, oh, just let's hang on for a little bit longer. I was. <laughs> yeah, funny you should mention that. <laughs> I think, like, Ira's been, like, dead. Like, his muscles have all been completely locked up since the stage thing. And he's going to, do I have to, like, walk past Mark to get to the door? I mean, kind of, yeah. The seating areas are kind of in the middle of the room, and so you kind of have to skirt around the out, the outside or either. You could walk, you could, I mean, there's any number of ways you could use to take to get to the stairwell. You could walk around them, through them, past them. He'll walk past Mark, stop, look over his shoulder, and go, hey, Mark. He doesn't say anything. Yeah. Uh, I will keep going. Enjoying the rest of them. All right, heading down the stairs and looking for. Should we look? Should we try and talk to Michelle? Cassandra wants to just leave. Yeah, Jenny is still crying. <laughs> yeah, how long has it been? Can we look down on her watch? See what? How much time has elapsed? Probably about four minutes. I say. I mean, don't you guys want to just talk to these? I mean, yeah, you guys don't look so good. We need to leave. And we need to not come back. What are we going to tell? 
what's his name? That guy who... I'm going to tell him exactly what happened. And I'm going to tell him that Abigail is lost. She's not coming back. I'm also going to tell him to burn this fucking building to the ground. Do that. Oh, well. Danny just shakes her head. I would really like to have a beer. Am I drinking alone? There's a bar um, just down the street. I mean, I'll go with you. Uh, yeah, just give me one second. Jenny's going to go find like a bathroom or even not a bathroom, just somewhere private where she can collect herself real quick. Uh, Ira will c- kind of like follow her to where she goes, but he's obviously not going to like he'll stand out. If you go into one of the apartments or whatever, he'll stand outside the apartment to give you space. But he's I don't think he's comfortable yet. Yeah, sure. She just needs a minute. There's an old telephone nook in the hallway uh, on the first floor across from Abigail's apartment that you can probably kind of just duck into. Yeah, she's going to do that and try to calm herself down, fix her makeup, that kind of stuff. Just as everyone walks away, Cassandra will be the last in line, but she'll push the door open to 10B just to A, make sure that nothing has changed and then just to keep it open. Not a thing. Yeah, she'll uh, she'll linger there for a bit, looking and join up with the others. Yeah, Jenny will join up with everyone after a minute once she's calmed down. So does that mean you're um, buying, agent? She looks Ira. <laughs> I can. Great. Jenny. Mm-hmm. I um might try and hurt someone tonight. Don't let me. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And Jenny will lead everyone to a bar. <laughs> Easy enough. Yeah, there's, uh, it's not exactly the fanciest place in Manhattan, but it'll get the job done for sure. Is there a payphone in there? There is. So as everyone's starting to get settled down uh, into their seats, I'll be just a moment. And Cassandra's going to go ahead and go to the payphone, and she is going to try and call her boyfriend. I'll say he picks up. Real quick, what kind of guy is... Bradley. Yeah. Does he go go by Brad? Yeah, I I call him Brad, but you know. Okay. Yeah. What what kind of... What's his personality like? Uh, You know, he's very enthusiastic. He's very excited to be in a relationship, uh, but otherwise he's, you know, he's an EMT. He's blue collar, you know. Cool. Okay. Yeah. You dial the number, and it only rings a couple times before... He picks up. Brad. Hi, it's it's uh, Cassie. Oh shit! Hey, Cassie. God. Hey, how are you? I I'm sorry, Mister Call the other day. I was I picked up another shift. No, no, it's it's okay. Um, I just uh, um, I think I'm gonna be out here a little bit a little bit longer than I anticipated. Oh shit! Okay, uh, is every is everything okay? Um, yeah, uh, it's just a very, uh, delicate case that I'm working on and it's, uh, just requires a little bit more of my attention. You sound tired. Are you sure you're okay? Um, yeah, I, uh, and, uh, she's trying her best to hide it, but she's starting to have a little bit of a, 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 a breakdown in the phone booth. Yeah, it's just a uh, long hour, you know? Okay. Yeah. I mean, you, you listen, you know, you can, you know, you can talk to me really anything. I, I don't care how bad it is. I mean, whatever it is, let's talk about it. It's just, uh, I'm working with a bunch of new people I've never met before. And, um, the case itself is pretty heavy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I imagine they didn't bring you all the way out there for nothing. Yeah, it's uh, it's one thing to just be you know, tagging and bagging and at home. It's a, a very different thing to be doing what I'm doing out here. Well, I mean, you got this right. Like you're, you know, you know what you're doing. And you're gonna clean up in no time, and you'll get back home, and we'll talk about it, and get you to where you need to be. All right, get you back in the right headspace. It, I mean, I get it. You'll, but I'm here. You know, you know, I support you. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I'm such a jerk. How have you been? How? Oh, yeah, there was a, there was just a crazy pileup. DUI turned into 
it was rough, but you know, we, we, we saved some, lost some, but you know, it's all right. But we can talk about that when you get home. Just you get home safe to me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, uh, I'll keep you posted. I'll let you know when I'm on my way back. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And listen, just get some sleep. Okay. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. Yeah. Okay. I, I love you. I love you too. And I'll hang up. And as soon as she hangs up, she kind of uh, chokes back a little bit before letting out a, a pretty heavy stream of, of tears. But she's facing away into the corner so that she's keeping her expression and all of this to herself as much as she can. There's a loud bang on the table next to you. And there's this obviously drunk, older gentleman, for lack of a better term. You done with that fucking phone yet? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's all it's all yours. Cassandra will wipe the, the snot away from her nose and uh, just try to quickly freshen herself up before uh, stomping out of the phone booth back to the others. How close is she to us? It's not a very big place, so I imagine it would like. I mean, a, a guy your size, you could probably get over there in two to three steps. Yeah, because if he hears the bang and the cursing, Ira will stand up from the table and. And walk over there. Yeah, the drunk guy kind of staggers over and, and drunkily picks up the phone receiver. Hira's going to put his like big, gigantic, meaty hand over top of the drunk guy's hand and hang the phone up with it. And then with his other hand, grab his shoulder and turn him around. What the fuck, man? And then Ira's going to hit him once in the throat, as hard as he can. Grab the back of his hair and start hitting his head into the nearest available hard object. As soon as he grabs him, Jenny is running over there, given that he told her that this might happen, and she's going to try to get in between them to, like, make him snap out of it and stop. Yeah, so you you lash out. I won't even make you roll, because this guy's completely wasted and unable to put up any kind of defense. But you lash out, and you hit him right in the throat, and he immediately begins to gag and cough. And you grab the back of his head and just start hammering it before you feel a gentle grasp on your arm. Ira's face is still dead, uh, but his, like, every tendon in his body is standing out and he's completely beat red. Hey, take it easy. <sighs> I got the message. Ira will kind of, like, almost dreamily shake his head a little bit and then let go of the guy and take a step back and keep kind of, like, taking deep breaths in and out. Uh, but he's still kind of like dead eyes staring at the guy. And his eyes look completely fucking crazy. Yeah, the, the drunk guy on the ground, he is very obviously unconscious. His eyes rolled up into the back of his skull and slumped to the ground, blood kind of seeping from the wound to the back of his to the back of his head. And whoever looks over the bartender is very clearly on the phone with someone. Okay. So much for a nightcap. We gotta go. Okay. Okay. I gotta wave over it. Well, I guess Cassie's right there. Uh, but I guess I'll wave over at Mark. <laughs> I mean, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Close your tab. We gotta go. <laughs> yeah, Mark. Mark would have uh, come over uh, as well when this started happening. So he's right there. And uh, yeah, he grabs his coat and we go. Cassie stays put actually, and as you all start to file towards the door, she's gonna. Just linger there in front of the phone booth, just looking at this unconscious man for a moment. And then after a little bit of time, she'll kneel down and just start to try and stabilize him. Make sure that like he, if he does have a concussion, that he's like propped up, you know, all that stuff. Roll first aid. Actually, I won't make you roll. I won't make you roll. With your first aid rating, because it's, it's actually pretty good. Let me see what it is. 70. Yeah. With your first aid rating... He clearly is concussed. There is no telling when he's going to regain consciousness, but you do know to turn him on his side and make sure he's he's breathing and he won't swallow his own tongue or any vomit or anything else. So you kind of just make sure he's in the best position possible to ensure unobstructed breathing before you join the others. Yeah, she'll look back at the bartender and uh, just call an ambulance, okay? And she'll duck out. So, hotel, I guess? 
And Mark's already in the street trying to flag down a, a taxi. <laughs> I never got to have my beer. <laughs> Jenny looks at him a little exasperated, but then there's like a little smile like, oh my god, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> he actually smiles back. I think there's bottles of stuff in the mini bar, maybe. Okay. We'll say you all eventually hail a taxi and with one in the front and two in the back. And no, three in the back and one in the yeah, front. Three in the back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cassie will sit in the front. Okay. Jenny's in between the two guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you all make your way back to the hotel. And I'm very curious to know what you do next. Looking for a drink, first of all, since we didn't get one. I mean, it is a best western. I don't know if they had mini bars. There's maybe like a bodega with a liquor license down the yeah. street, like that yeah, liquor yeah. store. But yeah, also best westerns generally. Well, I don't know, uh, like generally, but they usually have some sort of a bar in them, right? Most of the time. Uh, in the '90s, I don't know. We'll say you all are very easily able to find a, a bodega that's still open that sells, you know, malt liquor, beers, nothing like too crazy, but enough for you to, if you want to get a buzz, you will find a way to get a buzz. Ira's going to buy about four times the amount of beer he probably needs. Oh, jeez. Okay. Yeah, easy enough. As they're leaving the bodega, he will hand Jenny a six-pack. I don't think he asked her what she likes to drink. But he'll hand her a six-pack and just go, thank you. Why did you do that? Uh, he was talking to Jenny. No, Cassandra's talking to you. Does he say anything? I think, like, he looked, he had, like, some sort of a genuine expression on his face when he was looking at Jenny, but when he looks at Cassandra, he just looks completely flat again, and he doesn't say anything. We've all had a fucked up night. I don't think there's rational reasons any of us are going to do anything for the next few hours except to drink. So. You could have killed that man, Ira. If I wanted to kill him, he'd be dead. That shuts Cassandra up, and <laughs> she hangs her head back and keeps to the back of the the group. And he just holds the six pack she was given, kind of like looking, <laughs> down, looking down at the ground, like, oh, that was intense. Whose room do you all go back to? Well, Cassandra will go back to her room because she has to go drop off her kit as well as the evidence that they found from today. So the map and uh, the receipt. Okay. I was going to go back to his room, but make it kind of like look back at Jenny and Mark like, I bought. Five, six packs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jenny will follow him, I guess. Yeah, Mark Mark will go there, too. He kind of does look back at Cassie and tries to, like, it's super awkward, but she kind of tries to smile and, like, be like, you should come join us, that kind of look. But, yeah, she'll follow him. I'd say probably, like, 15, 20 minutes after you all gotten settled into Ira's room, you'd hear a knock at the door. Ira will get up and open the door. Does Ira and Jenny and Mark talk about anything in the interim before Cassandra arrives, or do you all just kind of sit and drink in silence? I'd say, like, chat, like, Ira's maybe a little bit more chatty than he has been in the past, but he wouldn't start conversation, but he would respond. He would actually respond to stuff. Yeah, Mark's not going to uh, drink beer, but he'll get some water and use one of the, you know, plastic cups that are, you know, next to the to the uh, sink and just drink from that. You don't drink? No. No. Um, like I said, lips that touch beer will never touch mine. Is that what you say? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, no, it's just I was I was raised pretty strict, you know, and I just never got a taste for it, I guess. I mean, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't see the point in it. To be fair, he did buy um, five things of very shitty beer, so you're not missing out. She says that she opened one. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I mean, I always, I always heard Amstel Light was like the best you could get. I think Ira actually like has a little laugh, but his version of a laugh is just like a guffaw kind of. <laughs> like a tiny giggle. Like yeah, like do you know how um how Nick Offerman laughs? Yeah. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he does like a Nick Offerman laugh and then quickly stops himself. Amazing. 
that was um we're not going back there so i i remember that agent marcus he i mean he told us that we were we were supposed to find out what's going on i have no idea what's going on and we were supposed to to do something about it right i don't feel like we've done nothing about it we found out as much as we could which is almost nothing except for the fact that that's not a place for people to go into not if they want to come out okay but you can't burn it down i, I was just gonna look at her and, and kind of like i guess like physically tilt his head why not what happens to the people that are in there i think everything that's gonna happen to those people has already happened and is happening. You don't know that. I mean, by burning it down, that will have to have some kind of effect on them. They're alive right now, at the very least, in whatever hellscape it is, but they're alive. Jenny, who are we sending in there to get them? You? At this point, we'll say that Cassandra arrives. Yeah, she'll knock on the door. Yeah, it's not worth it. And then Ira will get up and walk towards the door and open it. Uh, he gives Cassandra like a little bit of a look, like a long look, but uh, steps to the side and motions. Come on in. I hope I'm not intruding. No, come in. And yeah, she'll just sit on the edge of one of the beds, or the bed, I don't know how many beds he got in his room. But she'll sit on the edge of the bed and place her hands in her lap at first, looking around. Definitely sort of awkward girl at the party for a moment before she sees the six-pack, or I guess four-pack at this point, and uh, she'll reach down and grab a beer. So what do we do? We know we can't go back at night, so we go back during the day. And I know that's New York, but neighbors are nosy everywhere. No one came out when you kicked in that door. I don't think we should go back. We make a report. We let them know that that place is... Is what? He shrugs. Something different. Something else. I don't know. Something we shouldn't go back to. Something no one should ever go back to. Ever again. Mark? Jenny? Thoughts? I'm just wondering who the superintendent is. You think it's the devil? Because I think it's the devil. What happened to us today? Nothing we will ever understand. You keep saying that, but I don't doubt that I'll never understand it. I'll, I don't doubt that any of us will, will ever understand it, but it knows things about us. And who's to say that's just going to stop in that? Who's to say it's just going to stay inside those, those apartment walls? No one. But if you look for it, you will find it eventually. Well, maybe there's some way we can cut it off. Ira shrugs. Didn't work out so well for the last people I... You what? I worked with. What happened? They were more like you than me. And that ended up... being a problem. I don't want it to be a problem here. Okay? Yeah, Cassandra looks away a bit and just... sips on her beer. I mean, I, I keep thinking that there's some kind of i don't know there's some some kind of a clue that we've missed or a lead that we haven't followed talking to the other people who live there i just don't understand where you think those leads are going to lead you i mean maybe it'll help us understand what we got to do to shut that place down for good maybe I mean, at this point, you, you're talking about, I mean, how can you burn something that ain't even there? We can burn what is there. Maybe that's the door. All those people will be trapped, not dead, if you do that. Is it worth you getting stuck in there to get those people out? My dad's in there. What if what? it was the one you loved? What? What? I saw him when I went by myself. I didn't think it was real, and then what Mr. Castain said... It's real, and he's in there. He's been missing for years. You saw him. 
your, your dad. Yes. Well, that certainly changes things, doesn't it? Yeah. I'm not going to ask any of you to go back, but I think I have to. You know what my job is. If you go back there, I'm going with you. Mark, when, when we've been up there, has anything jumped out to you? Anything personal? Only the, those gadgets that the, were drawn on those napkins. If we're going back, I think we should avoid the, I don't know what to call it, the upstairs, smoking room, whatever that is, as much as possible. Follow all the things that we can before going back up there. Talk to the other tenants. Is there anything on the, like anywhere in the building we haven't been yet? We haven't spoken with the other tenants, aside from manual. Do you have a blueprint of the building? You do not. Yeah, so we can still talk to Lewis Post and Michelle Van Fitz. I mean, her name is on that script. It, maybe she knows, maybe she knows why, and maybe she doesn't, but I feel like that, that's maybe where we start. Yep. I can't get it out of my head, the uh, seeing all of those things there. You mean like the puppets? Yeah, I guess mannequins, puppets. I mean, I'm not going to lie. That was pretty creepy. Made me think like I was in a movie or something. Jenny, with your background in, what was it, anthropology again? Yeah. Uh, is there anything, any events that speak to this kind of thing, this this play or, or uh, marionettes or anything like that? Yeah, I guess question for the... DM, maybe I need to roll for it, but any sort of, I don't know, mannequin <laughs> lore that I'm aware of? Puppet lore. Puppet lore? <laughs> not specifically. No, not really. I mean, in the stuff that I was reading about and that Jenny told me about, from what we researched, all sorts of people with a connection to this building have had connections to the theaters, theater or manuscripts or things like that. Asa, what's his last name again? Asa Darabondi, that guy write, wrote about some manuscript for a play that somebody called the King of Yellow gave him. Does that name ring any bells to any of us? Oh, wait, no, it wasn't the king. The name of the play was King in Yellow, right? It was. You mentioned three. So Lundine had been asking for Loa in June, which was the one that, yeah, so Lundine was asking for that. And then Libro Secretorum Manifesta. Well, was that a play also? The, the, the journal that Jenny read didn't really go in any like too much detail. Okay. It was just, it was a book though. It was a book and he had returned it to a bookshop. Yeah. And then yeah. the next day is when the man in red delivered the king in yellow. And then the Craig worked on backdrops and set pieces. Thomas Manuel had a play. Seems like it runs through all this stuff. It's anything artistic. You know, the clockmaker the house that was built that was an oddity when it comes to architecture, just a bunch of winding halls and doors and secret passages. And it's like, like I said before, it's they obsessively create something artistic. Well, then I think we can at least agree to go back during the daytime, morning and, af morning and afternoon. We don't go upstairs. We'll just finish up our... Well, We'll finish up our questioning with the other tenants and when you guys were researching did you ever see blueprints for the building no they they would have had those at city hall i think do we know if the original blueprints were for a three-story building or a six-story building 10-story building i mean we can check it out i'm not sure what it would get us but it might be interesting to know Sarah Bondi was the architect, right? 
Myra Shrugs? Yeah, he was. Or he was a architect. Who knows what that crazy guy put together? Yeah, he died in the 1950s. So it depends on when it was built, if it was him or not. He also drowned up to 20 children. So that's also part of it. I mean, with your engineering thing, too, with all those kids dying, it, another common through line and connection seems to be a lot of death. Yeah. Like Jim always says, when you run into a wall, there's no substitute for good old fashioned police work. Why don't we just get out there and talk to some people? Look at the look at the apartment again. Abigail's apartment. There's still a lot of stuff to look at there. That's all we can do at this point. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, if that's settled, y'all, I think I am going to turn in. I think I'll follow. Well, I won't follow you, but I'm going to turn in myself. Good night. And you see that there's this, like, increasingly nervous energy that Cassandra's radiating, and she sets down a half empty beer can on uh, the, the like TV console, and she'll start to head towards the front door. Ira's going to grab himself another beer and then stop, put his hand on another one and give Jenny like an eyebrow up like. Yeah, she'll take it. Sure, I could use another one. Okay, go pass her another one. Good. With your nervous energy, what's that about? Who? Cassandra? Cassandra, yeah. Mark's just trying to figure out. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, he's got a high enough humor. She's just really shaken up. Okay, all right, yeah. You know, it, everything's escalating to a point where she's, you know, knows that she doesn't have any control over, over the situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, Mark's going to go back to his room, and he's going to call Sharon again. All right. Which is, you know, kind of his nightly ritual. Uh, they call each other. Strangely enough, when you call this time, despite the hour, she doesn't answer. Hmm. All right. Well, she probably has an answering machine, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. Yeah. So, hey, sweet pea. Uh, I guess you, uh, you must be out studying at the library. Uh, I hope you uh hope it's nothing too bad. Uh good luck. Yeah, on all your tests and everything. Um yeah, I'm just I'm still here in New York City. Uh, I don't know. Um this town's kind of crazy. It's starting to get to me. Sharon, I I've been thinking maybe uh maybe after all this is over I can I can come and, and visit, you know, I got something I want to ask you. All right. I'll uh, talk to you later. Love you. Bye. Hangs up. Nice. And yeah, unless you want to terrorize us with a horrible nightmares, I think we're just going to go to bed. All right. Yeah. Nope. I think I, I think I fucked with you all enough for one for one session. Yeah. Yeah, Jenny does have another drink with Ira before she heads out. I think he will actually, before she leaves, make a point of being like, please don't go back there tonight. <laughs> she kind of laughs and then stops herself. <laughs> I won't. Trust me. Not tonight. If you go back there, just, just call me first. Deal. Holds out his hand for a handshake. Yeah, she takes it. Don't burn anything down while I'm gone. I'm not going to burn down the building if your father's in there. Thank you. Not unless we have to. Yeah, she. I think she gives like kind of just a small nod. She understands where he's coming from. And she'll head out, get a cab, head home. All right. So Cassandra, go. What does Cassandra go to bed? Yeah, Cassandra just she's she's wiped, so she just heads back to her. But she heads back to her room. Uh, she organizes, places the pieces that she found today into the overall kind of scheme of the evidence that's mounting. She already talked to Brad, so she's going to bed. Okay, Cassandra's in bed. 
Mark's in bed. Ira, you going to bed? He'll stay up and have another beer. He'll actually, you know what? He's probably going to stay up and have another two. Uh, like, he's not going to drink enough to get floored, but he is going to, he's definitely going to get a little, a little buzzed before he turns in. Right. Self-medicate just a smidge. Yes. And Jenny goes home and calls it a night. Yep. As best sleep that she can manage to get, she tries. This is a first. I don't know how to handle this. Everybody just going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ira kills someone? <laughs> Everyone! <laughs> uh, so, okay. So for those who are going to sleep, which is everyone, roll 1d6 and you gain that much willpower back. No, I didn't lose any willpower. Me neither. Okay. I sure did. Ooh, three. That's a good, that's a good amount. Yeah. I needed that. Yeah. And we'll say uh, the next morning comes without uh, incident. And you all reconvene. Well, everyone's already there, but Jenny, you I'm assuming you meet up with the others at the Best Western. Yeah, wherever they want to meet, whether it's at the place or the Best Western, she arrives with coffee, as usual. Good old Jenny. You can get used to this. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I feel like... Asking if we're ready is kind of a moot question, but are we ready? As much as I will be. All right, yeah, Cassandra gathers the kit, and yeah, I guess we, we take a cab over there, or take the train, whatever works. And probably a cab, probably a cab. Fair enough, yeah. So I guess while these guys are doing that, Mark will say, you know, Ira had a good point. Why don't, why don't I swing by the uh, city hall and see if I can find the blueprint for the building. Okay, are you sure? I mean, you're, you, you seem to be really good with people. I don't want to... Oh, yeah, we're going to be talking to those people, too. Yeah, I mean, it can wait until after we talk to them. Let's do that. All right, so we'll go there first, and then, then I'll go. Or somebody else can go, but in, in any case. I was definitely going to the building with you guys. He doesn't have any research capability or desire to breed. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'll head over first. So we get there pretty early. Should we buzz them from the outside or, or just knock on their doors? I think we should take the direct approach. Just knock. All right. All right. Who, who, whose door are we knocking on first? I vote Michelle. Yep, me too. Who's all going? Are you all rolling four deep? Yeah, I think Ira's kind of interested in doing a little bit more of a canvas of the building itself because uh, they haven't really, like, they've just kind of gone straight to apartments. They haven't really looked for, like, if there's an office somewhere or, I don't know, anything really. But he also is not entirely comfortable having other people in the building without him there to protect them. So he'll kind of pitch that as an idea. Like, maybe before we go and talk to these people, we should just do a little snoop around. So if you if you're looking around... There's something that seemed kind of strange to me. The, well, this one guy, what was his name? Hold on, let me let me check my notes for a second. Manuel, he's fine. Don't, he's fine. Don't worry about it. Manuel's cool. He's fine. Charles Lundine. Charles Lundine is the son of the guy who used to own this place, and it said that he hanged himself in the second floor ballroom. Do you think there's a ballroom in this place? I mean... I think it's upstairs. But this says... It said second floor, right? It could also be talking about the hotel that we found the information on the, the broad album. Not to remind everyone that I'm a terrible person and I came here by myself, but I did also come across a hanging man, so... I'm sorry, what? What? <laughs> I think he's upstairs. I think that's where he died. Maybe there's multiple people who hang themselves, but... That does kind of point out the, the idea that there are rooms here, or could be rooms here that we haven't looked into yet. Rooms that are not, you know, other people's homes. I feel like just before we go and knock on doors where we know people are in them, like, maybe we can just kind of do a little walk around the, the three, like, normal floors and see if there's any extra doors or whatever. Sure. Fine. Yeah. Well, since you're doing that, I will... I'll show you an image. These aren't the actual blueprints. For, like, don't treat these like the actual blueprints for the building, but this is the general layout um, for the ground floor, the first floor, and the second floor. But that's generally the layout. 
But as you look around on the inside, you only see the the doors leading to the different apartments. Can I do it the outside of the building? Absolutely. Yep. So you walk around and, and there are alleyways on either side of the building. On the street side, there is a entrance to what for all intents and purposes is probably the basement. But it looks like the only way to access the basement is is from the street. Oh. That's weird. Ooh. Fun. Is it, oh, it's, it's, it's got the like cellar doors, the, the middle grid right. thing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, like a lot of a lot of those places in the city where the, the basement access isn't necessarily from the inside of the building at proper, it's actually from the exterior. Okay. Uh, he'll go back inside and tell everyone. Found a door. Should we check that out? Hey shrugs. Well yeah. Yeah, I'm taking that as a yes. That was a yes shrug, so we should go. Oh, all right. <laughs> you you can read him a lot better than I can. <laughs> Well, now that I know that he drinks shit beer, it's a little easier. There's the smallest quirk at the side of his mouth. I heard it from. <laughs> yeah, so who's going to break into the basement? Are we kicking it again, or do we want to try to be sneaky here? Well, if we're on the street, we should probably be a little bit more discreet. Is there like a padlock on it, or? There is a padlock. Does anyone know how to pick any of these? As FBI agents, we could call a... A locksmith and show him our badge, and he'd probably pick it for us, right? It eh, de- depends on the scruples of said locksmith. Uh, you also have a key ring. Oh, that's right. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> wait, where did the key ring come from? Uh, we got it when we first uh, got it. A one. <laughs> Detective, Detective Gear Danda. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ignore all that because we're smart. And Cassandra just pulls out the key ring and starts to look at the, the keys does, to see if there's something that fits. Does that have a key for like every apartment in this building? No. Oh, darn. Is there a key to the, the cellar, though? There is. Yeah. She'll, uh, she'll unlock it and stand aside. All right. Mark will throw the doors open and go on down. Ira will go down with him. Um, yeah, he's not going to uh, push Mark behind him, but he will make sure that he goes down with him and does the kind of like doors and corners. Cassandra will follow and we'll turn on the flashlight so that we've got a little bit of light. Yep, Jenny will go down too. Yeah, you go down and, and there are there are light switches so you can actually turn the lights on. But it, it's not terribly big. There are four storerooms and then a boiler room. Uh, but it looks like one of those rooms has been converted into some kind of workspace. It's like a painting painting studio. Oh. Jenny is drawn to that immediately. She wants to go check out what they're working on. Yeah, she'll go. Cassandra will go with Jenny. Yeah, Iris sticks close to Jenny. That's for you. The room smells of oils and paint thinner. There is a blank canvas labeled My Great Work sitting in the middle of the room. There are three plastic pails of some kind of oil carefully stacked in the middle of the room. A note taped to them reads, for Sammy Pickup, S-A-M-I. Does that Sammy name ring any bells? No. Is Pickup like capitalized, like the last name, or is it just for Sammy to pick up? It's it's capitalized. uh, Sammy is capitalized. Sammy Pickup sounds... Like the most drug dealer name I've ever heard in my entire life. Yeah, no, no, no. So, I'm sorry. No, for Sammy. So the name is capitalized S A M M I, and then pick up. So a verb, like gotcha. to, yeah. <laughs> Sammy pick up. <laughs> Sammy pick up. Uh, there are three paintings as well down there, stacked in the corner. I look at them for sure. The first painting is of a child-sized clown in yellow and blue cavorting on a stage, trailing a white paper dragon behind them. You recognize this. Ira? Ira, yep. Is that the same as the clown I saw in the park? It is. Roll sanity. Oh. (laughs) Okay. Oh, nice. 50 out of 68. You lose nothing. Oh, sweet. The painting behind that 
is a haunting image of a white-faced specter standing on a rug at the top of stairs in the midst of a conflagration. Fire climbing the walls and ceiling around it, and the rug is a strange aquamarine color. And the third painting is a young, thin man with, with wispy, thinning blonde hair and wearing a hospital johnny. It is duplicated in a mirror. His mirror twin is deformed and muscular with a misshapen head. Does the patient look familiar to us? No. Ira will not mention the clown. Yeah, I think Jenny's too busy looking at the pictures to try to get a read off of him for anything, so. Yeah. Yeah, there's a very brief flicker of something across his face, but if nobody's looking at him, you wouldn't notice. While looking at the paintings, I'd also like to search the room, scout it, to see if there's anything else that might be interesting. Yeah, roll search. Yeah, 43 out of 71. You don't find anything new or of note. You just notice that the the space hasn't been used in a long time. So there's no, like, any mail or anything like that? No newspapers? No. You do notice that the paintings have an author's mark in the corner uh, of TM. Yeah. Thomas Manuel. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. He didn't have any paintings in his own apartment, did he? He did not. It was all pretty much stereo and audio equipment. Okay. So I'll actually lean down and point the initials out to Ira. TM. Thomas Manuel. Yeah, he just kind of keeps looking at you. And I'll say just to add salt to the wound, she was holding up the clown painting at him, pointing at the initials. But uh, yeah, not getting a reaction out of him. She'll uh, put the painting down. Yeah, he'll just give her like a pretty flat look. He doesn't really know how he, or he doesn't really know how she wants him to respond to that. She knows what he did, and he knows what he did. And if anything, I think seeing the crown painting would make him happier that he killed Thomas Manuel, or more satisfied with it than he was. <laughs> Is there anything in these paintings, if I look at it with my anthropology glasses? that based on the other research we've done and things that we've experienced or seen or known, is there any kind of like significance for these scenes that I can draw out? No, except maybe the fire, but not the carpet, not the figure, nothing else that stands out to you as being something familiar. The pale face that we saw in the painting, did that resemble the face that I saw in the pit? No. Well, I mean, it's a featureless pale face, so I mean, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, it, it, I'd say yes, it resembled slightly, yeah. but I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a featureless pale mask, so they're all going to kind of yeah look similar. As long as they don't have true sanity, it's fine. Yeah, no, you're good. What do we do? Do we go up? Yeah, I mean, these things are creepy, but I don't know if there's anything else for us to find down here. Now let's see if we can track down Michelle. I'll follow. follow. All right. Head towards Michelle Van Fitz's apartment. Okay. A question about the map. There's a pretty large area on the north side of each of the four that says something shaft. Air shaft. Air shaft. Doesn't that seem like a big air shaft? I don't know anything about architecture. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> but for like all the building, all the apartments. Yeah. So it serves as it's it's the central layer for all the apartments. So yeah, maybe not. I don't think that's too out of the question. Okay. All right. All right. We head to Michelle Van Fitt's apartment, and Mark is going to knock on the door. Do you just secure the basement behind you? Yeah. Put the, the lock back on. Okay. So yeah, you knock on the door and a Caucasian woman, squat in her late 20s, answers the door wearing uh, what looks to be kind of anti-establishment clothing, like these hemp vests and pants, non-prescription glasses, beads, just kind of looks out through the crack in the door. She doesn't open any further than that. Uh, looks out at you all. Can I help you? Are you uh, Michelle Van Fitz? Who's asking? I am Agent Mark Hansen, 
FBI. We got a few questions about Abigail. I believe she, uh, you, you know her, she lived here. I do. What is it you would like to know? Do you mind if we come in? Do you have a warrant? No. Is there another place that, you know, I mean, I understand if you don't want us to see your place. Is there another place we can sit and, and talk a while? I want you to be comfortable, man. Right here is fine. Can I, while they're talking, just give her a quick look over to see if she's just being cagey because she's anti-cop or if she's trying to hide something deeper? Yeah, go for it. Roll human. Nine out of 66. Nine out of 66. Yep. She does not like cops. And you could see her body tense as soon as he introduced himself as agent. Listen, Fitz. My name is Cassandra. Uh, listen, we were just trying to figure out what happened to your, uh, what happened to your neighbor. And if you know anything, anything at all, that would help with his investigation. We're just trying to find this woman and make sure that she's okay. Well, I have told the police that have been here already investigating this crime that there's nothing that I'm aware of and nothing that I know. I just know that she's missing and judging by the fact that you all are still here, I'm assuming she hasn't been found yet. No, she hasn't. Um, we've actually spoken with some of the other tenants. Uh, I believe uh, one of them's Thomas, who lives on the floor above you. How well do you know him? About as well as any of the other tenants. We all kind of... Keep to ourselves. This is an artist co-op, after all. We're all here to work. I've seen him in passing. Uh, what about Mark Rourke? I have no idea who you're talking about. I've never met a Mark Rourke. Uh, well, uh, turns out uh, Thomas was uh, using, at least using her name uh, in a play that he was writing, and there was another castmate named Mark. We were just wondering if perhaps he was another neighbor of yours. No. Human check. <laughs> yeah, go for it. I do not remember knowing that it was like an artist co-op or an artist collective or whatever. We just found it out. Okay. Yeah, 15 out of 74. She's telling the truth. She has no idea who, the, who you're talking about. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Do you smoke? Do I smoke? We know that the smoking lounge is a popular out for the tenants of the building. Uh, we're just wondering if you uh, frequented it, ever saw Abigail up there? I'm sure I have no idea what you were talking about. There is no smoking lounge in this building. Are you going to ask nonsense questions the rest of the time that you are here, or can I close the door and get back with my day? I'm gonna human that. <laughs> Go nuts! Does she really not know anything about the smoking lounge? 14 out of 80. She has no clue what you're talking about. Yeah. All right. I think we should let her get on with her day, everyone. Sorry about them. You know how the government is. We do. That's why I haven't opened my door yet. Yeah. Don't blame you. You might want to find better company, young lady. And so myself. She kind of gives like an exasperated look at the other three. <laughs> she's she's already shut the door. All right. <laughs> All right, get it. Mark's feelings are hurt by that. What did Mark ever do? I was just playing along. Oh, hoping right. she'd like one of us, maybe. Okay, well look, she has no fucking clue what's going on. No, clearly not. Which is, I mean, everybody else around here seems to. So either something's happened and she's forgotten or they've just used her name in a weird play that she genuinely has nothing to do with. Why does, what is one tenant, well, two tenants, why do they know about this? Well, three tenants, because there's Abigail who clearly knew about it. There's Thomas Manuel who made mention of it and has written about it in this play of his. And then uh, what was the other one? Roger? Caruso? Roger Caroon. Roger Caroon, yeah. He he won't come down from there. Exactly. Like, why doesn't she know what's going on? Is it something like is it something that happens after dark that that they suddenly understand where they're at? Or maybe it's what did that guy say? It's not her time or she's not meant to understand it right now. 
God, even saying this out loud just feels, I feel insane. Well, we've still got Louis Post, and we turn around on the other side of the hallway is Louis Post's apartment. I mean, do we really want to keep doing this, though? I mean, if these people genuinely don't know about it, I feel bad asking questions. And what if that leads to them finding out and going in there or something? Not a bad point. Well, we didn't even say it was on the fourth floor. We just said the smoking lounge. Okay, so we don't talk about the fourth floor. Yeah, just keep it centered on Abigail. Ask about Abigail. All right. Mark knocks on the door. Mark, when we talk to the next person, you should ask who their building manager is and how we get in touch with them. That's a good point. Good point. All right, I'll do that. Knock, knock, knock. Another young Caucasian man, probably in his mid to late 20s, answered the door. Disheveled, but attractive, wearing a button-down short sleeve shirt and khakis. Uh, yeah, hi, hello. Yeah, we're, we're here looking for uh, information about your neighbor, uh, Abigail. Oh, yeah. I was wondering if you would mind if we ask you a few questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, no problem. Do you want to come in? Definitely. Okay, yeah. Come on inside, and he'll, he'll open his door. You're Lewis, right? Yeah, yeah, Lu- Lewis Post. Uh, you are? Uh, yeah, I'm Mark Hanson, um, FBI. Oh, no shit. Okay, all right, yeah, right on. Are these all, like, are you all, are you all FBI too or something? Or you with the NYPD again? Nope, FBI for us. All right, okay, cool. All right, yeah. Come, come on inside. It, it, just, uh, you know, forgive me. The place is kind of a mess. Well, technically, that's not a crime. <laughs> Good for me, I guess, huh? <laughs> yep, you're safe. Hey, whew, that's one already out of the way, isn't it? And the place is a dump. There is grease-stained pizza boxes everywhere, paint containers, dirty clothing, uh, garbage spread over the kitchen floor. It is a mess. The ink stains on his hand, does it look like there's any art or anything he was working on somewhere? Not that you can see immediately. Okay. As long as he doesn't, like, ask her to stop, Jenny's just going to casually, just kind of curiously look around while they talk. Okay. Mr. Post, so this is is the co-op, right? Or you're an artist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, uh, yeah, I've worked on, uh... A couple things here and there, uh, mainly comic book covers. Uh, did you know Abigail well? I rarely saw her, uh, but she lived right below me. Um, you know, I, I know she's missing, and I know the police are looking for her, but that's kind of it. We heard from other uh, people in the building that there was a going away party for Abigail uh, just before she disappeared. Did you hear anything about that? Uh, going away party? No, no, I can't say I have. I want to humor that. Yeah, go for it. Because I think that's 56 out of 80. He is telling the truth. Okay. Do you actually mind if I take a look at some of your comic book covers? I'm actually doing my art thesis on pop art, so I'm kind of here just to be their art guide, but I'd love to see your work if you wouldn't mind. <sighs> Ooh, roll persuade on that. Okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah, 68. 68, all right. Yeah, 68 out of 80. He uh, kind of looks and, and he, he, gets a little, he gets a little bashful. He says, I, I don't really have anything here. I've kind of I kind of sold off everything I had. You know, I got laid off a couple months ago, but I could draw you something if you want. That'd be amazing. Okay, yeah, uh, sure. And, and he'll grab some some charcoals and a sketch pad and start kind of drawing something. Cassandra gives Jenny a bit of a curious look. Not sure what to make of this young man who's just like down to draw anything if he's a professional artist. <laughs> as as he's sketching. Uh, by the way, who, who in the building owns a dog? Uh, nobody that I know of. Oh, uh, we, had, we actually uh, heard a dog uh, a couple days ago, we 
weren't sure if it had belonged to Abigail. No, never saw her walking a dog. Well, Mr. Post, we're just trying to find out everything we can. Talk to as many people as we can. Can you tell me, um, where's the manager of this building? Uh, how can we get a hold of them? Oh, you talk. Oh, oh, uh, Miss Lachance, Cynthia. She uh, she works at Art Life. That's the company that owns the building. Uh, I guess you. I guess she's the manager. You don't have like a a night manager. Uh, no, no, you sure don't. Just uh, the only one I've ever dealt with is Miss Lachance. All right. Can we have her contact information, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, just give me a sec. And he sets down the sketch pad and the charcoals, and it's just, it's like a very, I mean, it's not, it's not terrible. It's a, uh, just a little sketch of you all standing at the door, what you were, where you were standing, where you, what you were wearing. It's very rough, but, um, he gets up and he ruffles around looking under some piles of clothes and a old pizza box and he pulls out a business card and hands it over to you, Ira. Ira gives him a little bit of a flat look, like dead in the eyes as he's want to do before slowly reaching up and taking the card from him. And then he'll just pass it off to the nearest person, Mark or Jenny. Or it's a business card for Art Life for the company, but it has Cynthia Lachance's contact information, like name, number, address on there. Then it looks like the Art Life building is located at 23rd Street and 3rd Avenue East. Is there anything else you all need? I mean, listen, I, I, I want to help as much as I can. Uh, the fact that she's still missing, that's uh, it's crazy. What would you say the was the relationship between Abigail and the other people in the building? I, you know, listen, we're all kind of loner artists here. We don't really socialize a whole hell of a lot. Um, I mean, we know each other well enough to say good morning. Uh, it's not like we're going out of our way to hang out with each other. Um, I couldn't say. I mean, nobody hates anybody. I mean, I don't think anybody here would have been responsible there was a mention of a, a possible boyfriend, a salesman. Did you know anything about that? Is there any tenant in the building who also works in sales? Not that I know of. No, we're all we're all artists here. I mean, uh, Roger's a writer. Thomas is a painter. Uh, Michelle's a writer. I paint. Abigail paints. I mean, yeah. No salesman. Not that I know of. And we didn't really know each other enough to, you know, talk about our dating lives that's fair well um unless anyone else has anything to ask i think we'll just get out of your hair thank you for your cooperation though yeah yeah Any, anytime again I'm, I'm really i'm mortified by the mess i i really apologize but you know feel free to stop by if there's anything else you all need of course do you ever go up on the roof every now and again not i don't make a habit of it you go up at night me? No, last thing I need to do is trip and fall and break my damn neck. Smart. Hira gives a look at everybody else. Well, thank you for the drawing. Sorry to impose on you, but it's really good. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks. What's, uh, what was your name? Jenny. Yes, uh, it's nice to meet you. You too, Louis. If you need anything, just, you know, don't hesitate. Just come knock on the door. Will do. And he'll, uh, yeah, he'll show you all out. Do I need human to roll to know that he has a crush on her? No, not at all. <laughs> That's pretty fucking obvious. <laughs> when they're outside, Jenny's like looking at the sketch very carefully to see what kind of clues <laughs> that he's actually crazy might exist. <laughs> it's, uh, there, are, there are none. It's, you know, it's rushed and it's a very rough sketch, but it's, there's no hidden images or symbolism or anything. Cool. Souvenir, then. <laughs> She'll fold it up and put it in her pocket. Nice. Is there anyone else that we need to, to ask around for, or do we want to head to Art Life? I think Art Life makes the, is the next logical choice, <laughs> talking to the actual building manager that we <laughs> haven't talked to yet. She can perhaps even give us a bit more history, a bit more insight. Maybe she knows something. And if not, she might be able to point us in the direction of who owns the building. Who's her boss? Yeah. Cassandra will turn tail and start to head towards the front entrance. As we're doing, though, she'll walk back to 
10 B just to make sure that it, I guess the door's still open. Oh yeah. She'll take note of that and then just walk up with the others to find a cab. Thank you for listening to Delta Green Impossible Landscapes, part of the Black Project Gaming Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts and be sure to visit blackprojectgaming.com for previous Delta Green episodes. You can also listen to our ongoing Waterdeep Dragon Heist and Barovia, California campaigns. If you'd like updates on all future releases, please follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Until next time, I'm Vince, your host and handler, with Brett as FBI hostage rescue team operator Ira Brewer, also known as Agent Morgan, Cami as Dr. Jenny Archer, anthropologist and Delta Green friendly, Doug as FBI Special Agent Mark Hansom, also known as Agent Meshock, and Jack as FBI Special Agent Cassandra Reese, also known as Agent Madison. Thank you again, and remember, we'll be seeing you.